Thank you to all of our new attendees, because it seems like we have a lot of people joining us for the first yeah. time today. So welcome to our community. And an extra thank you to those who are joining us for the second, third, fourth, however many times. Uh, we love having you over and over again, and we appreciate all the help you provide in the Discord server. Especially the dancing kitties. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's the best part. <laughs> hey, a quick note, uh, in addition to Chris's slides, there's also a PDF in the ACM-webcast-content channel. Please download both. Uh, ACM webcast content, uh, the, the, the FAC in there has a bunch of questions that we're, we're frequently asked. Uh, please grab that as well and just do a quick scan through, especially if you're using VMware Workstation, VMware ESS, ESX. Um, and I think we've already answered the question that M1 and M2 Max just probably aren't going to work for this. That fact also has the login details for the web versions of AC Hunter, which you can use for this class. Please do yeah, not in, in delete the, databases uh, or in the or Intel change. Max. Those should work fine. Right? Yes, it's just Intel the Max M1, are fine. M2. Yep. yep, Intel Max are fine. It's just the M1, M2 where they decided to uh, make an expensive Raspberry Pi. Oh, exactly. Um, and if you if you use the online versions, T Hunt One through T Hunt Three. Countermeasures. Com. Please don't delete databases. We would appreciate yes. that. It messes it up for everybody when you do. All right, we ready, folks? Let's do this thing. I'm going to go off video for this. So um, as I mentioned, half the team is sick. So we're just, you know, really, really doing well. I am hopped up on way too much uh, day quill right now. So that should make doing this fun. Uh, but I'm going to apologize in advance if I like sniffle, sneeze, or anything else in the mic in everybody's ears. I'm going to try and make sure I get to that mute button really quickly when I need to. Uh, but I'm just going to apologize in advance if I mess that up. So as Bill mentioned, um, in the Discord channel below the one we're using for chat, there's ACM webcast content. Please go there. There's a copy of all the slides there that you can go through and download. And that should have everything you need in there. Uh, we kind of talked through a lot of this stuff already. I'm just going to hit it really quick. Here are the links to the, each of the different VMs. So if you've got VirtualBox, VMware, you've got a VM you can download specifically for that platform. If you're using something else, try the generic OVF file. VMware, a uh, couple common problems we've seen with that. One is it pops up saying it has hardware compatibility issues. If you use the hardware compatibility tool, that'll usually go through and fix the problem. So just follow the steps here. You'll be in pretty good shape. Um, VMware also likes to change the IP address that gets assigned to the VM. So if you're trying to connect to the .129 address that's in the slides and it's not working for you, try this command from the terminal inside of the VM, and that'll tell you what the IP address is of that system. You'll be in pretty good shape from there. And it likes RAM. It likes CPU. If you're running into some other problems, that's usually one of the first things to try is throw some more memory at it, throw another uh, vCPU or two at it. A lot of times that'll clear up a lot of the VMware problems. With VirtualBox, tends to run pretty stable. Uh, the biggest problem we've seen is sometimes when people go to run the VM, the port forwarding setup doesn't come over for some reason, in which case um, you can just go in and set it up for yourself. The link in the slide here will bring you to a blog entry that'll walk you through it with nice, you know, pictures and screen caps and circles and arrows and all that fun stuff to make it nice and easy for you. Here's all the login info you're going to need. And it's been posted in the Discord channel a couple of times. This will show up again right before we go in and start doing the labs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, you'll have it there as well. But basically, um, the login name is threat, password is hunt, uh, hunting, unless you're using the AC Hunter interface. And yep, hey, there it is in Discord. This is all your login information. Where can you find the presentation? You can find it in the ACM webcast content channel, just below the one that we're using for chat right now. So yeah, here's all the login credit information. When you first log in to AC Hunter, load up the DNS cat JA3 data set. We'll come back and revisit that one a little bit later. Some shameless plugs. 
We've got a new bash scripting class over on Anti-Siphon by the one and only illustrious Bill Stearns. Um, I am fully convinced that Bill can solve most of the problems in the world with bash because, oh my God, some of the things I've seen him do is pretty amazing. Uh, but it's a great online class if you want to go through and do that. Some upcoming classes I'm teaching. So if you get out of this class and you decide, hey, I wish I knew more about the network stuff. I've got an intro to packet decoding class that's going to be going off at the end of the month. If you go through this class, you enjoy it, and you want to recommend it to a friend, hey, we've got this class running again in the beginning of December. That'll be the last one for the year. And if you like this class and you want to take it a little bit deeper, you can go through and uh, do the advanced threat hunting class. So links for each of those are there. We've also got Wild West Hacking Fest going off in a couple of weeks. Uh, so that's a cool event. It's in, um, it's in Deadwood, South Dakota. It is a live event, but you can, uh, you can attend virtually as well. There's two days of training. There's a ton of different classes going on. Mine aren't any of them, which is awesome, which means I get to actually go up there and sightsee for a couple of days because I've been there for a couple of times and never had time to just kind of check things out. And then there's two days of talks. There's a couple of different tracks that are theme-based, and you can go through the tracks, or you can jump between them, basically whatever works for you. But we're going to have a booth there. So if you do go to Wild West Hacking Fest, uh, please come by the booth and say hello. All right. So some logistics. Top of each hour, we'll do a 10-minute break. That gives you a chance to go off, check email, you know, water the cat, feed the kids, whatever it is you need to do. And then at the three-hour mark, so two hours and 49 minutes from now, we'll do a 20-minute break. That'll give you a little bit longer to be able to go through and do that, do that stuff. Now, I'm going to be doing a lot at the command line. And not all of us are really comfortable working at the Linux command line. I will do my best to go through and explain what's going on with commands. One of the things you'll notice is I use what's referred to as nested commands. So the concept is I run one command, and rather than printing the output to the screen, I send that output through a second command. And then I may take that second command's output and pipe it through a third command. So I'll try to walk you through what's going on. And so that, that should get you through a lot in this class, but a couple things you can try. One is just type the first command and see what that output looks like. You know, there's usually a problem we're trying to solve. In other words, there's something we want to get done. Like, hey, what was the longest duration connection that took place in this data that we're evaluating? So we may have to type something on the command line to go through and try and figure that out. Try that first command I gave you. See what the data output looks like. Think about how, okay, how does this get us closer to solving that problem? Now add in the second command. How did that change the output? Does it get us a little closer to just being able to focus in on the problem? A lot of times the reason we're nesting the commands is because we need to sort things and reorganize them, or the first command might produce a ton of data. And then the second command only pulls out the little bits that we're actually interested in saying, but run through them, you know, keep adding in one command at a time. So you can do a command, hit up arrow, add in a little bit more, hit up arrow, add in a little bit more and do it that way. You can also use explainshell.com. It does a really good job of kind of talking you through uh, Linux command line stuff. So <clears throat> quick overview of the goals for this class. Uh, we're going to start off talking about cyber threat hunting in general. And then from there, we're going to very quickly jump into what's a good process to use to try and find nefarious actors on your network. What's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck? You know, in other words, we all have limited time. So how should I invest that time in trying to find the bad guys to kind of help orchestrate my best chances for being able to identify any systems that are currently in a compromised state? And then we'll finish it off with doing some hands-on labs. So I, I will talk you through the process, but then I want you to actually do the process because that's how most of us actually learn. So what is threat hunting? I like to pull this one out. I actually pulled this out and put it back in because I see a lot of people get this wrong. Um, I, I've seen way too many threat hunting talks where you have, you know, folks that are like as old as I am saying, you know, oh, well, I've been doing threat hunting for, you know, 10 years and, you know, been doing it before electricity. And, and no, no, this is actually pretty damn new. 
if if you're saying, oh, 10 years ago, I was doing threat hunting because I was doing pattern matching and system logs, that's not threat hunting. <laughs> you've missed the point. Of, you know, you've missed the point of the challenge here. Threat hunting is an active search of the network. Typically, you're going to use behavior analytics. You're not going to use signatures. Why? Because the signatures change all the time, right? <clears throat> Attackers change the way they go through and do things. I'll give you, you know, it is just one of many examples, Sunburst. You know, Sunburst came out. Um, solar winds got compromised in like March, right? It was a it was a supply chain attack. They started pushing out the malicious code in like July or August. And then it was December before FireEye came out and and uh said, Hey, so there's this thing we decided to call Sunburst, and it looks like the Russians are into thousands of networks and you know, this is bad. This is something you may want to pay attention to. And everybody who was doing classic threat hunting completely friggin' missed it until FireEye came out and said, here are the signatures to look for. So when you're looking for signatures, you're only going to ever find old crap. That's it. You're never going to find the new stuff that you need to be the most concerned about. Now, for the folks who are doing it based on behavioral analytics, so for example, Rita, one of the tools we're going to talk about today, it's our open source network threat hunting tool. We had customers running Rita and AC Hunter as well, obviously, that in August were saying, hey, my solar wind server is all of a sudden creating a persistent connection out to, out to Europe, and it never did that before. This is a new behavior that doesn't seem to be business-related. I'm concerned. Yeah. And what they did is they said, okay, let's put in a firewall rule to stop this from occurring. So even though they had the malicious code on their environment, they neutralized it as being a C2 channel by implementing those firewall rules. But it was only because they were looking for behavior analytics rather than specific signatures that allowed them to go through that and do that. So threat, so our ability to do this is actually fairly new because this involves a lot of going through big data. You know, we'll talk about that more as we go through. So for the folks that are telling you, yeah, I've been doing this for 10 years, uh, uh, my personal opinion, they want to think their old skills are still va valuable, right? That's really, it, it's, a, it's an ego thing. For the folks that really want to make sure they do this right, they'll tell you, hey, I've been, and I'll admit it, I did this wrong for many years. You know, I, I wrote one of the original logging classes for SANS 20 plus years ago, and I was doing it wrong. I should have been doing it this way or at least as close to it as I could have. One of the things we'll get into more, start on the network because it sees all. Don't rely on your SIM. Your SIM should be more of a secondary. I found something interesting, so now I'm going to refer back. And I'll get more into that as we go through. Are we getting better at finding the bad guys on our network? There's a lot of data around this, and there's a lot of studies that say, yes, we are. My personal opinion, no, we're not. Uh, and, and I say we're not because when you look at these studies, they'll tell you the dwell time has gotten shorter. What's the dwell time? The dwell time is how long is it between when the attacker gets a beachhead on your network to when you actually detect that they're on your network and you start going into incident response mode? That is the, that is the dwell time of the compromise, if you will. That number looks like it's getting smaller in a lot of studies. Here's the problem with that. If we're getting, if we were in fact getting better, right? If we were actually saying, hey, it used to take us six months to find the bad guys, we're finding them in 30 days now. If that was actually a true statement, I would expect some secondary effects like it takes less time to do the work, it takes less money to recover, we're less likely to have the data get exposed to the public. And the problem is those three parameters haven't changed. So what does that tell you? Well, that tells you, yeah, maybe the dwell time isn't getting shorter. Maybe something else is going on. And in fact, there is something else going on. And these studies that say we're getting better at catching the bad guys, you know, we've got our dwell time down to 30 days or two weeks or whatever number they come out with. If you look at the data, they're including ransomware. What does ransomware do? Ransomware gets into your environment, runs around for a couple of days, encrypts your drives, and then tells you it's there. Well, so if the ransomware is announcing itself after three days, 
Is it really fair to say, oh, we detected it in three days? No, <laughs> no, that, that's a different data point. You can't mix those two together. So they're, they're parsing the data wrong, basically, and skewing it in a way that makes it looks like we're getting better, my personal opinion. Because again, when we look at these secondary items, like how long it takes to recover, like the cost of recovery, those numbers haven't been changing. So we still have a lot of work we need to do in this area. Where does threat hunting fit into our model? Well, when you look at the tools we have today, they tend to fall into one or two buckets. They either fall into the protection bucket. They're a tool that's designed to keep the nefarious actors off of our network in the first place, right? Things like firewalls, two-factor authentication. You know, you can read the list. I don't have to read every item on here for you. So these are all the things to keep the bad people out. The second bucket is tools we implement once we know the bad people are on the network, right? Incident handling is a great example of that. We know we've got at least one compromised system. We're going into incident response mode. We're going to go through and you know identify scope. Is it just this one system? What did they do to that system? What data may they have gotten access to? You know, These are all the tools we bring to bear once we know the bad people are there. The problem has always been this area in the middle. How do we figure out when our protections have failed and we need to go into incident response mode? That has been our big problem. That is what threat hunting is designed to resolve. So the job of threat hunting is to close the gap as much as possible between our protection tools failing and knowing we got to go in and handle this problem. And I mentioned start with the network. Why? Because the network sees all, right? The network is equal opportunity. Anything that can get compromised from the internet, guess what? It's plugged into the network. You know, if you have a computer running under your desk and nothing's plugged into it, and it's got no wireless or anything else, could someone potentially compromise it? Sure. Right? It, it, you know, if we're talking nation state and you've got nuclear secrets on that box, it becomes a valuable enough target that people may invest enough to try and compromise that system. Luckily, most of us are not in that shape. For most of us, what we need to worry about are attacks that originate on the network. Cool. So why don't we leverage that network to figure out if those systems have been broken into or not? We've, historically, we've fallen back on SIMs. And one of the things that I've learned the hard way over and over again multiple times, the SIM does not see all. Regardless of whether you think you're recording everything, I will bet, I will bet my paycheck you're not. There's always something that gets missed. Uh, we had a customer come in one time that rolled out AC Hunter and found five or six, somewhere in that range there, IP addresses on their network that were beaconing back to Kwanzu, China. And when they dug in and did an investigation, they found out that their facilities team had bought these IP-based cameras off of Amazon, and they came pre-compromised by the vendor at no additional charge. They didn't charge you extra for that, to take pictures of the inside of the facility where they were installed and send them off to, you guessed it, Kwanzu, China. So they bought, they paid for spies on their, in their uh, physical buildings. Oh, I hate it when we do that. But those things had been running for over six months before they had actually tagged it. And the reason was they had been using their SIM to try and find adversaries on their network. These cameras didn't log anything. And even if they did, come on, the camera's not going to generate a log entry that says, hey, I'm stealing pictures of what the inside of your manufacturing plant looks like. Don't worry about it. You know, you're not going to get a log entry like that. So relying on system logs, it's a good secondary item. In other words, hey, uh, using network telemetry, I figured out that 192.168.1.50 is compromised. To now go to system logs, and see what logs were getting generated during the time frame where the system was in a compromised state, that makes perfect sense. But to try and figure out it's compromised, oh, it doesn't work. And we've been doing this for a long time now. You know, logging is one of our oldest security technologies. It predates firewalling. It goes back to the 80s. And it still hasn't helped us keep the bad guys out of the network. We got to stop doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. This is a way to go through and do that. Start with the network. So 
One of the nice things about the network, attackers can't stealth their packets. They can't hide them. They can try and make them blend. They can try and make them look like normal traffic, but the data is still there. It's just a matter of reading it correctly. One of the easiest things to go after is the command and control channel because the command and control channel sets up a persistent connection. In other words, attackers out on the internet, he can't attack, he can't connect to that internal system directly. So he typically sets up an intermediary called a C2 server or a command and control server. Now he connects to the command and control server and he has that compromised system also connect up to the command and control server and it effectively acts as a proxy in the middle. So now the attacker can submit commands to the C2 server. And when that compromised system calls into the C2 server and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? It just executes those commands that are sitting in its queue. Going after that C2 channel because of its persistency is one of our easiest ways to go in and figure out, is that system in a compromised state? So what does threat hunting look like? Let me start with kind of a high level, and then we'll kind of dig more into the details from there. Our first step is to go through and identify connection persistency. In other words, I said that compromised system is going to be doing regular check-ins with the command and control server to say, hey, I'm here, I'm compromised, do you have anything for me to do? If we can identify that channel and distinguish it versus normal network traffic, we're well on our way to being able to figure out what systems have been whacked and which ones aren't. Once we identify connection persistency, the next thing we usually want to do is try and figure out, hey, is there a business need for this? So for example, you know, if you run a Windows system, it connects out every 30 minutes via UDP uh, 123. Well, it's simple network time protocol, right? It's keeping your system in time sync. There's a business need for that. Your Windows system will also reach out on a regular basis to say, are there any new patches available? There's a business need for that. So sometimes persistency is okay because we can explain it away as there being a business need for supporting this type of connectivity. What we're looking for are those situations where we can't explain that. You know, if it's if I have a system regularly calling out to windowsupdate.com and it's got a valid digital certificate, that's probably okay. It's probably a business need for that. I can safely ignore those. But it's calling out to, you know, evilbadguy.ru, you know, once every couple of minutes. We don't do business with evilbadguy.ru. They're not a vendor. They're not a customer. They're not anything that would make sense for us doing that regular connectivity. Now we need to go down the rabbit hole and figure out what's going on. So business need check, step two. Step three, protocol analysis. Okay, now that we've looked at this and said, I can't identify an immediate business need. Now we need to look at it and say, okay, does this look like, does this really look like normal traffic or does it look like somebody's kind of bending the rules a little bit? What do I mean by bending the rules? I mean that per the letter of the law of the RFCs, most, um, excuse me, most C2 traffic is 100% compliant. But when you look at it compared to how it normally acts, it's acting differently. In a way that usually, if you know what to look for, you can spot. I'll give you a perfect example. So you've got your window, you're running Windows 10, you're connecting out to the internet. And anytime you connect to an HTTP server, your system sends a user agent string. And part of that user agent string identifies that system as being a Windows 10 system. Well, what if when it talks to one IP address and one IP address only on the internet, it identifies itself as Windows 7 instead? Well, that isn't logical, right? (laughs) That doesn't make sense. That isn't breaking the rules, but it's kind of bending them. Wait a minute. Why are you claiming to be Windows 7, but only when you talk to that one system? That's usually one of the clues that this might be a command and control channel to look at. We'll talk about that type of thing more later. Once I analyze the protocol, the next thing I want to go through and look at is the internal system. Do I have system logs I can fall back on? What do I know about that system? Is it a server? Is there any critical data on that? You know, we're going to investigate the host as much as we can. Once we do that, now it's disposition time. Now, the figuring out it's not a threat, we might have actually been able to do that earlier. So, for example, back on step two, business need for connectivity, 
we may have figured out, oh, hey, it's calling out to windowsupdate.com and there's a valid digital certificate. That's just Windows calling out to see if there's patches. And we can disposition that as being safe, add it to our safe list. We'll talk more about what those are later. And then we, we're, we're out of this uh, flow chart loop at that point there. But if we can't do that at that point there, we're doing it at the end. And we need to figure out, is this safe and something I can add to the safe list? Or is this something that needs to trigger incident response? So when you talk about what is a threat hunter's job, it's to come up with one of these two dispositions for every single system connected to the network, not just the ones logging to the SIM, every single one. I have seen thermocouplers compromised. I've seen network hardware compromised. So we can't just focus on desktops and servers. We've got to look at everything these days. You know, We've got IoT devices getting whacked. If they're not generating logs, the only way you're going to figure that out is by looking at the network. So start on the network. So this is the beacon interface for AC Hunter. Let's talk a little bit about what it's showing us here. So AC Hunter is collecting up 24 hours worth of data, and it's going in and doing an analysis on that data to see, is there anything here that makes me think the system might be in a compromised state? Take a look at this graph on the bottom. Every bar represents a one-hour period of time. So we've got 24 hours here total. My y-axis is quantity. So what this graph on the bottom is describing, how frequently does this internal IP connect to that external IP? And you can see it's about 120 times every hour, or about twice per minute, about every 30 seconds. Notice I've got a little red line here. That The tool didn't do that. I mocked up this image to show that. What I'm showing you here is we're seeing about the same number of connections taking place all the time. When something's opportunistic, you know, let's say like your use of Google, right? You may do a couple Google searches and then not do it for a couple hours or a couple of days. And then you may go in and do a bunch of them again. That's what's referred to as opportunistic. And that's how a lot most connectivity takes place. But when you see something like this, this is persistent. And in fact, you could even say it's programmatic, right? A human isn't going to exactly every 30 seconds connect to Google or some other website. This software driving that process. So anytime we see persistency, we need to ask ourselves, is there a business need behind that? So the fact that I could draw a flat line, that's what's identifying this as being really persistent. Now, this graph here is identifying how often were certain dwell times seen. In other words, we said it's about twice per minute, but what this graph is telling us is it's not exactly twice per minute. It was twice per minute about, what's that, 800 times, 500 times, somewhere in that, yeah, 500 times. But it was 20 every 28 seconds and every 29 seconds more frequently than that, about 1,000 times for each of those. Go out a little bit further, lower and higher, and the numbers get any, get less. This is what's referred to as a bell curve, right? Because it kind of looks like a bell. This is indicative of cobalt strike, which is used 95% of the time in all command and control channels by both red teamers and adversaries. You know, sunburst was one of the most uh, advanced attacks we saw come out of the Russians at the time that it was released. Sunburst used Cobalt Strike for its command and control channel. So, you know, one of the things I do is anytime I see this bell curve, that immediately says to me, Cobalt Strike. Somebody's running Cobalt Strike. Something weird's going on here. Well, let's say we look at this and we say, yeah, there's connection persistency here. See these two fields, queried FQDN, historic FQDN. Queried FQDN is this is the fully qualified domain name the user looked up that brought them to this IP address. Historic FQDN is this is what was sitting in DNS cache that resolved to this IP address. The user didn't necessarily look it up right away. It just got back a cached answer. But either way, this should be a fully qualified domain name here, right? Because when we do HTTP connections, 99% of the time, we're typing a fully qualified domain name into our browser, right? You know, Sally in accounting 
doesn't connect to servers via IP address. IT people do it sometimes. You know, we're going to do it as part of doing our labs, but it's a rare occurrence. So what this tells me is someone was doing a direct connect to that IP. Ooh, that's really suspicious. So I've got a direct connect to this IP in DigitalOcean, which maybe I can say I don't have resources there, but it's a public cloud, so somebody else might. There's no fully qualified domain name. It's persistent, cobalt strike signature. I look at this and I'm like, ooh, I'm really feeling like our internal system is compromised. But I don't know if I'm convinced enough yet to hit that big red incident response button. Because if I hit that big red incident response button, this turns out to be nothing. If I do that often enough, what do I turn into? Chicken little, right? The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Oh, wait, never mind. The sky is falling. No, wait, never mind. So I want to be pretty certain I've got a compromised system before I say we need to go in incident response mode. So one of the things I may want to do is go back to this internal host and see when it was connecting to that host over this time frame, what application was running on that system. Because if it comes back and tells me, oh, yes, yeah, Slack was creating these connections, and I know we use Slack internally, not a big deal. But if it's something else, eh, that might be a problem. One of the open source tools we released is Beaker. Beaker, I'll talk about this in more detail later. I'll give you more details on this later on. But Beaker leverages Microsoft Sysmon utility to collect ID3s. ID3s are applications talking on the network. So that could be an inbound connection or an outbound connection. Either way, we record all of those and only those. We don't watch permission changes. We don't watch registry key changes because, wow, those just happen all the time and it just saturates the network and the database. And it gives you more a lot of information that really isn't useful until you figure out you're in a compromised state, in which case you're probably just going to do a forensic analysis anyway. So you could have gotten the data that way. All it records is what apps are talking on the network. So if I've got Beaker running, I'll get a little Beaker icon here in my AC Hunter interface, or I could go in and do this as a manual search if I'm not running AC Hunter. And this comes back and tells me, oh, when that IP was talking to that IP over that time frame, that was Runtime Broker making those connections. Huh, what's Runtime Broker? Runtime Broker is a utility that checks the permissions of apps you download from the Microsoft App Store. Microsoft has an app store? Yeah, it doesn't everybody these days. You're not one of the cool kids unless you have your own app store, as it turns out. And Microsoft wants to be one of the cool kids, so they have an app store. So what they do is this tool makes sure that when that tool says, oh, I only need these couple of permissions, it stays in that sandbox and doesn't try to break out of that. So this is checking to see if your permissions are being adhered to. By calling back to DigitalOcean, oh, that doesn't make sense. This is a Microsoft tool. First of all, to implement those permissions, it only has to execute locally. It only has to monitor things locally. If it was going to reach out anywhere, though, it's going to be back to Microsoft's network, not DigitalOcean. This might not be the runtime broker we think it is. And this is not common behavior for runtime broker to be connecting over and over and over again like this. Now, yeah, this is enough data for us to say this, this system's probably in a wax state. So notice what we did. We identified connection persistency. We looked at that and said, oh, yeah, this looks weird. We need to pay attention to it. We did some protocol analysis. We went and looked at, oh, hey, no FQDN was queried. That's kind of strange. Hey, it's, it's jittering the beacon time. That's kind of strange. And then we jumped into our uh, endpoint logs to say, yeah, this doesn't make sense. This gives us enough to be able to get to a point where we can say, yeah, we're compromised. We need to go in incident response mode. We know at least this system's blacked. Now, don't cross the passive active line. What do I mean by that? I mean that, at least today, threat hunting teams tend to be fairly small. It's one or a couple of people, that's it. And you have a specific set of skills for doing threat hunting, which means you may not necessarily think about all possibilities that can pop up. One of the nice things about incident response is it pulls together a lot of smart people from multiple disciplines, not just the security people, but the operations people, the legal team. You get a lot of smart individuals in their own, who, you know, people who are smart within their own vertical 
to get together to try and come up with the best decisions possible on how to move forward. Don't do anything that an attacker could potentially detect until you're in incident response mode. Never do this as part of your threat hunting. I know there's folks out there saying otherwise, but here's the problem. The problem is you may do something that you think is smart that turns out to be really brain-dead stupid and gets you in a lot of trouble. I'll give you one common example I see all the time. Folks go in, they see a system's in in a compromised state like we just did, and they immediately isolate the system. Well, yeah, of course, Chris, because it's compromised. Why wouldn't I isolate it? Here's the problem with isolating the system. As soon as you isolate it, you broke the C2 channel. What if this is not the only system that's currently in a compromised state? What if there are 12, 15 other systems, and I have seen this during hunts, that are also in a compromised state, but rather calling out twice per minute? They're only calling out every six to eight hours. They've got a much slower dwell time that allows them to fly under the radar. They don't make it a lot harder to go in and detect them. So you think you have one compromised system. You have 15 of them. Now you go in and isolate this one box. What happens on the attacker side? When this box stops responding, now the C2 channel breaks. The next time one of those 15 other systems calls home and says, do you have anything for me to do? It's immediately told, yes, you're now the primary channel into the network. And bang, the attacker's back in again, only they're at a different IP address. And now they go poking around to see what's going on with that system that used to be up 24 hours a day and now all of a sudden is gone. And they realize, oh, wait, that system was got isolated. It got taken offline. They may be on to me. I may be limited in the amount of time I have on this network, and I don't want to leave behind evidence where they could catch me, so I'm going to go scorched earth. So those 15 systems that I compromised, I'm going to try and replicate out from them as quickly as possible and go after as many hosts as I can, and maybe start encrypting drives or whatever to lock up the data so you can't use that against me. In other words, if we had said, hey, we have a compromised system, We need to go in in incident response mode. When we got in incident response mode and a team of smart people are sitting together saying, what should we do next? Someone may have thought of that and said, well, wait, is this the only box compromised? What can we do to figure that out? Oh, hey, let's look and see. Is anybody else talking to this IP address at all, even if it's less frequently than every 30 seconds? And if there is, they become part of the scope. Now, we not when we go to do isolation, we're not isolating one system. We're isolating all 15 at the same time. We've all heard multiple horror stories from people saying, hey, yeah, we had a bad guy on the network. We, we sanitized that system and kicked them out. And somehow they got back in a couple hours later, and we're not sure how they did that. Right? Sounds scary, right? Here's how they did that. They weren't in one system. They were in multiple. You just didn't find the other ones. And they turned those on as their primary channels and started coming back after you. So that's why I say don't cross the passive active line. What we do as threat hunters should always be undetectable to the attacker. So going through logs in our sim, collecting packets off of the network, that's something that you can't figure out is happening to you if you're an adversary. You don't know if they're actually collecting packets or not. Those are the types of tools we want to bring to bear. So let's talk about some detection techniques. So we said we wanted to work with network traffic. How much network traffic do we de- need? At a minimum, you want 12 hours of data. You want a, and This could be packet captures. This could be Zeek logs. This could be summary information. And I'll deep dive more into that later. But when we're looking for persistency, we need a minimum of 12 hours worth of data. Most network threat hunting tools work with 20 minutes of data or less. That's why they were missing Sunburst. That's why none of them caught it. Because Sunburst was going off every 15 minutes, and it was jittering plus or minus a minute and a half. So that dwell time might be as short as 13 and a half minutes, might be as long as 16 and a half. Well, if I'm only keeping 20 minutes of data, well, that means there's one 
maybe two connections I can look at to try to figure out this connection persistency. Oh, no, that's not enough, right? But if I've got 12 hours worth of data, well, that's about four connections per hour, right? <clears throat> now I've got 48 connections to look at to try to figure out this connection persistency. If I've got 24 hours, well, now I've got 96 connections to figure out this connection persistency. So notice the more data I can keep track of, the easier it becomes to go through and figure this stuff out. That's one of the one, one of the reasons why Z, quite honestly, is one of my favorite thread hunting tools. You're not <clears throat> if you're not using Zeek, you're not thread hunting. No other tool is as good. Because what Zeek does is it records every session it sees, not just ones that match on a signature. It records everything. And it does it in a very efficient format. Um, it saves data in a compressed format. It strips out the stuff we don't care about, like CRC checks and stuff like that, that we would never use as part of our security checks, and stores the minimum we need as security people. And what's nice about this is Zeek's an open source tool. Anybody can use it for free. So you can download it and go to town. And it is awesome. I'll talk more about Zeek as we go through. But this is going to give me a recording of every session that takes place on my network. I can now go back through that data to figure out, you know, what's actually taking place, who's implementing uh, connection persistency. Oh, and we want to analyze things in pairs. So it'll be an internal IP to either a fully qualified domain name or a remote IP address. And which one when you want to use kind of varies, and we'll talk about that as we go through. So where do I want to monitor my traffic? Typically, where you want to monitor it is at the internal interface of the firewall, right? Because that's going to see all your internal private addresses. If we try to monitor outside the firewall, it's already gone through NAT. So I'll still see C2 connections, right? I still would be able to detect them. But the only source I'm ever going to see is the firewall. So now I got to go back through my firewall logs to see which internal system was using that source port at that time because everybody's using the same source IP. So you can't use that. Which one was using that source port at the time? And it adds an additional layer of complexity to running down these hosts. Well, if I just monitor at the internal interface of the firewall, those complexities go away. My Zeek uh, sensor, by the way, this for most networks, this can be a Raspberry Pi. You don't need much to get this done. You need hardware. You don't want to do this virtualized. Hypervisors are horrible at throwing away captured packets. Uh, typically with a VM, you'll be lucky if you can scale to 100 megabit. You'll be lucky. With a Raspberry Pi, you can easily scale to a gig. If you're saturating a gig, you're probably going to miss some packets. But a Raspberry Pi will keep up at a gig. So typically what I want for my Zeek sensor is some sort of inexpensive hardware device, unless I'm pushing, you know, tens of gigs of throughput through the internet, two interfaces, one to monitor this traffic, and another one that allows me to remote into this box. So I can SSH in and manage it. I can push the Zeek logs out to another system, that type of thing. But that's going to give me my full visibility. Now, does targeting C2 have blind spots? Of course it does. Everything does. Nothing's perfect. If there was one thing you could do that would save you all the time, hey, we would. this would have been a five-minute class. Do this one thing. Bang, we're done. Hey, yay, everybody's happy. And that's not how it works. The blind spot is compromised systems that don't cre create a command and control channel. You've got to fall back on your classic endpoint you know, software to try and deal with stuff like that. The nice thing, though, is that these don't happen that often. Not pet you is the last time we really saw something like this in the wild. And of course, the problem with NotPetya was that was the Russians attacking Ukraine, right? So they did a, a supply chain attack against a vendor that created uh, tax software that you needed to pay taxes within Ukraine, thinking, well, this will hit everybody in Ukraine. What they lost track of is that it's a global market. There's companies that do business in Ukraine that do business in other places as well, including Russia. And all of a sudden, bang, systems in Russia are starting to get hit. Uh, global shipping shut down for like a couple of days because of this. So it's real easy for something to do things you don't expect it to do 
if you don't create a C2 channel. So most compromises have a C2 channel. It also means you need less intelligence built into this. Because if I'm just going to release it, go, it's going to be able to kind of figure out everything it might potentially run into. If I have a C2 channel, I can always go in and tweak things as I need to. So you do have a weak spot there. And we got to fall back on our EDR software and you know maybe system logs to try and deal with those. But luckily, we don't see them that often. So start by checking for connection persistency. So from a communication perspective, this uh, takes one of two forms. What's referred to as a long connection or a beacon. What's the difference between those? We'll kind of dig into that. A long connection is just simply, hey, call out to that command and control server, hold that connection open indefinitely. So now anytime the attacker has C2 commands they want to submit, that session is up and running and it's there and it's easy to go in and kind of get access to. You can, there's two ways to look for long connections. You can look at individual connection time, or you can look at cumulative communication time. I always prefer the latter. Why? Because you get some really you know, smart folks that know how to bend the rules that'll do things like, uh, like Metasploit, right? So what Metasploit does is it sets up its C2 channel, holds it open for 30, sec- uh, for 30 minutes, kills it, and then immediately reestablishes the connection again. Why do they do that? Well, imagine you're reviewing a day's worth of data and you're looking for, you know, you you need a cutoff to decide what makes a long connection a long connection. How long does that connection need to be running for? So what most people look for are connections that run for five or five and a half hours or more, because that's going to fit within business hours. You know, most connections are going to be a shorter uh, connection time than that. So they'll look at anything that lasts for five, five and a half hours or longer, about 20,000 seconds. Well, if they're only running for 30 minutes, they're never running anywhere close to that five hours. So that stays down in the ground noise. When people go in and look for beacons, a lot of times what they do is they look for thousands of connections per second. And historically, that has worked out well. You know, beacons have been pretty jibbery. You know, we talked about the one we looked at was going off twice per minute. So that's going to create a lot of connections in the course of a day. So if we look for, hey, who's creating a lot of connections, that may help us find the beacons. Well, Metasploit is only going off every 30 minutes, which means it's only connect it's only connecting 48 times in a day. If my threshold is in the thousands and they're only doing 48, that's way into the ground noise. We'll never see that. So one of the reasons why I like to look for cumulative communication time is because with Metasploit going off every 30 minutes, closing the connection, reestablishing it, well, that's still a, a total of 24 hours of communication in a 24-hour period of time. The challenge is it's harder to calculate and identify cumulative communication time than it is individual session time. It takes a little bit more work, but it's not that hard, especially with Zeek, and I'll show you how to do that. So here's an example of where you'd see this within the AC Hunter interface. So this is telling me that when this IP address talked to that IP address, the duration of that was almost 24 hours out of the 24 hours. Okay, that's clearly something that's worth going in and paying attention to. Now, as awesome as Zeek is, it has a couple of, um, let's say, design decisions that have negative impact, negative effects. Well, that can have negative effects from a threat hunting perspective. One of them is the fact that Zeek does not log anything until that connection closes. So imagine I compromise one of your internal systems. I create a connection back to a command and control server, and I leave it open and running all the time. Well, Zeek isn't going to actually log anything for you yet. So there's nothing in your Zeek logs to tell you I've done that. Now, let's say I run around on your network for three months, and then I decide, okay, I've stolen all the data I came here for. I'm done. Let me delete everything and clean up on my way out and I kill that C2 connection. Well, you'll now get a Zeek log entry that says, hey, this IP address was talking to that IP address for the last 90 days. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. I look at my Zeek logs every day. Why is this the first time I'm hearing about this? And again, it's because of that limitation that Zeek doesn't log anything until the connection closes. Now, we created a module for Zeek that we've released open source, and that's built into Reader and AC Hunter. 
that when we collect the Zeek logs once per hour, we also make a copy of the current state table and we compare that to what's been logged. So in that situation I just described to you, we would see, oh, hey, there's this connection and it hasn't been logged yet. And we'll create a log file called openconnections.log and we'll record information about it there. So the result is if you check every hour, you would see every hour that connection's been running for an additional hour up to the 90 days. So if you do check your logs every day, the first day you'd see, hey, this has been running for you know 12 hours, however long it's been on your network book. You know, let's call it 12, 10 hours, just to throw out a round number. And then you go back and check your logs the next day. And now you say, oh, it's been running for 34 hours. Oh, wait, that's a long time. Is there a business need for this? What's going on here? And you could run that down right away. You don't have to wait till the 90 days, in which case it's too late anyway. With an AC Hunter, we log that on the long connection screen. See how the state of these is listed as closed? If you ever see open, that tells you you have an open connection that still hasn't closed up yet. So that's one of the challenges with Zeek. Uh, the other challenge with Zeek, uh, this is personal opinion, I think they've set their TCP timeout too small. The TCP timeout is set for five minutes. What does that mean? That means that if a connection goes dormant for five minutes, it assumes that connection's done, writes out the log entry, purges all of its state table information about it. The problem is connections can go dormant for much longer than five minutes and work perfectly fine. Thank you very much. I like to reset that timeout to 60 minutes. Why 60 minutes, Chris? Is that the longest it can time out for? Nope. I have seen connections sleep with no keep alive going by literally for days. It was Linux. It wasn't Windows, but it can happen for days. The reason I go for 60 minutes is because that's the state table timeout most firewalls use. And if the firewall is going to kill the connection anyway, it doesn't matter after that. So I usually reset Zeke's timeout from five minutes to 60 minutes, and both Reader and AC Hunter will do that if you have it go through and do the Zeke install. But what that does is if you don't do that, you'll have long connections that may look a little beacony, look more like beacons, and they're not. They're actually long connections. It's just Zeke's not creating the, uh, collecting the data correctly. So that's a long connection. What's a beacon? A beacon is just a repetitive connection that goes off at some time interval to create a connection between two systems, so between two endpoints. So for example, I described this a little bit earlier. I compromise the system, right? I get the, I do a phishing attack. I get them to click something they shouldn't have. There's now malware running on this system. Well, this attacker can't connect in directly, right? Because there's a firewall in the way. So what do they do? Well, they set up what's, uh, they set up it's effectively a proxy, but what we refer to as a command and control server. You'll hear CNC referred to as command and control, although the more common one is C2 server, you know, C squared, if you will, for command and control. But the idea is this compromised system is pre-programmed to check in with this box on a regular basis. So now if the attacker wants to execute something down here, they simply connect to the command and control server connect to the work queue for that system, and issue the command they want to run. So let's say they want to run the task list command, see what tasks are running on that box. They just connect to the queue and type in the task list command. Now, the next time this thing calls in and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? It's told, yes, I want you to run the task list command. And now the malicious code runs that task list command and exfiltrates the data output out to the command and control server where you guessed it, the attacker gets to see it. So the C2 server is basically acting like a proxy in the middle between these two. And with that said, we are up on the top of the hour. So let's go through, take a break. We're going to take a 10-minute break. I'm going to give my voice a little bit uh, rest. I'm sure you're hearing it's deteriorating quickly. I apologize again for that. I mentioned at the beginning of this, half the staff is sick. I am one of them. So uh, we're going to try and get through this the best we can. You sound great. Oh, thank you, dude. Really appreciate that, man. So, uh, yeah. So, look at your clock. Whatever time it is in your time zone, 10 minutes after the top of this hour, we'll pick up from here and keep I'm going. Through and do. <clears throat> is Active Countermeasures the same as Black Hills? We're sister companies. So, there is, um, well, 
there's a bunch of them, but there's Wild West Hack and Fest, there's Anti Siphon, there's Black Hills, there's Active Countermeasures. And the one thing they all have in common is John either outright owns them or partially owns them. So uh, John and I are both uh, co founders on Active Countermeasures. Black Hills, that was when he started himself. In fact, uh, I, I think I was customer number one. Uh, certainly in the top three when he first got Black Hills going. Uh, that That's the company that's been around for a long time. <clears throat> All right. So with that said, let's get back into the content. So we were talking about command and control and how it works. And, you know, this is kind of the basis of how command and control has worked for many years now. We're starting to see variations off of this theme, right? Attackers are taking... One of the nice things is that attackers have focused on hiding on the endpoint, they haven't paid a lot of attention to hiding on the network because they've never had to. When We've never been very good at finding them on the network, to be blunt, uh, but we're getting a little better at it now. So they're now starting to take additional steps to try and hide. One of the techniques we saw pop up a couple of years ago is this one here. <clears throat> the attacker takes their command and control server and they place it behind a content delivery network. We've seen Amazon used, we've seen Akamai used, uh, so this is, this is out there. What is, how does this change things? Well, with our first example, all the connections were going back to a single IP address. You could see the command and control server. So to go through and figure out persistency between these two endpoint IPs was pretty straightforward. Well, as soon as they take their C2 server and put it behind a content delivery network, all that changes, right? Because now you're not connecting to one IP, you're connecting to multiple IPs, the content delivery network servers that are responsible for your section of the internet. So I might see five or six different Akamai servers that it's talking through. So now instead of the beacon going to a single IP address, it's going to three, five, multiple different IP addresses all at the same time. So it makes it a little harder to figure out it's a beacon signal. Further, this is a content delivery network. It's going to have legitimate servers sitting behind it as well. So, for example, Microsoft makes extensive use of Akamai. So that traffic going back to that Akamai CDN might be a C2 channel. It might be Microsoft traffic, and they're blended in together. So I need a way to collapse together multiple IPs and then pick out all the stuff that has nothing to do with the C2 channel. And that's not easy to do. The best way to do it that we found is to use the SNI information within the HTTPS header. That allows you to see where was it going to on the other side. Use that as your telemetry. Now you need to be able to reach into the header in order to be able to do that. Not all tools can. So binding C2 servers sitting behind CDN networks is not common with network-based threat hunting tools yet. Folks are still coming up to speed on this. You can do this with Rita. You can do this with AC Hunter. <clears throat> if Chris Bragg could just visit me and spend a day or more on my network. <laughs> Depends where you are. We just had uh, a, a potential partner come in from Aruba. And I just insisted that, you know, we've got to do a week on site to have this conversation. This is one we can't have over a telephony thing. Now, if, uh, you know, you're someplace snowy or cold, eh, yeah, less likely. All right. So when we talk about detecting beacons, so far, what we've talked about so far is detecting them based on timing, right? It's calling out every 30 seconds, or it's calling out once per minute, plus or minus 50%. So that dwell time might be as short as 30, it might be as long as 90, but it's a, still happening about once per minute taking place. So that's detection based on timing. That last one I described, plus or minus 50% of the timing, that's what's referred to as jitter. The reason attackers leverage jitter is, one, it's built into Cobalt Strike, and like we said, 95% plus use Cobalt Strike. So it's there as a feature, so they'll use it. But most network-based threat hunting tools use this algorithm here, k-means clustering, to go in and identify uh, beacon connections. K-means, so there's a wiki on it. You can go read about it if you're into the math. But the short answer is k-means is just a math algorithm. It's designed to look at very large data sets and find repetitive patterns. So imagine I have 
a, a data set that is all my outbound connections from the day before. And there's 10 million connections that took place. But buried in there is one internal system talking to an IP address out on the internet, doing it once per minute, exactly once per minute, all day long. Well, that's a persistent connection. K-means will go through and figure that out. And it'll show you, hey, this is a beacon. This is something to pay attention to. As soon as you introduce jitter, K-means stops working, right? Because if it's sometimes 30 seconds, sometimes 90 seconds, well, that's not pers- that's not repetitive anymore. And because it's not an exact repeta- uh, repeating interval, K-means ignores it. Here's a dirty little secret. So for all the tools out there like Darktrace and others that try to rely on K-means to find their beacons, for anything that jitters, K-means doesn't work. So they got to fall back on being a signature-based tool. What do we say about signatures? Signatures are great for catching the stuff we already know about. Signatures are great for catching the test code that people post up on GitHub. It's not very good for catching the latest and greatest nation state crime where you know organizations and what they're using because they're not posting their code up on GitHub for everybody to go through and use. So there's no known signatures until it's actually found in the wild. So it's not the best way to go about doing that. <clears throat> so again, if we look at this over a longer time period, it becomes easier to go through and normalize a lot of this stuff out. We looked at that beacon a little bit earlier that was going off. We said it's jittering, right? It was changing between like 25 and 32 seconds, flipping back and forth. But it was still going off about 120 times every hour. So again, by working with a lot of data, 24-hour period of time, throwing things into one-hour buckets, we actually normalize out a lot of that jitter. And it makes it a lot easier to go in and grab this stuff. <clears throat> so within AC Hunter, there's that, um, how often are you seeing a certain dwell time screen that we were looking at earlier? <clears throat> this is it here. It tends to be in the upper right of the beacon screen. If I see something like this, this tells me this is a beacon with no jitter. This is going off exactly once per second. Because notice, all my connections map out at once per second. I don't see any other uh, lines further up on the time scale. If I see something like this, which is what we were looking at earlier, or maybe like this, that tells me there's jitter. It's not going off at the exact time interval each time. It's going off, you know, it's varying that dwell time between connection attempts. Now, like I said, if we can put these into bigger buckets and look at them that way, that's going to help normalize some of this out, right? It's going to grab five seconds about as often as it'll, it'll grab, you know, 46 seconds. So this will help kind of normalize this back out around the 30 second interval. This is actually a pretty good beacon, quite honestly. This is Cobalt Strike again. You can probably tell that just by looking at it. But this one, someone put some effort into trying to make this as random as they possibly could. The problem with Cobalt Strike, its beastly function is not as random as they think it is. It picks times closer to the mean more often than it does the min or the max. That's why you get this bell curve. This is actually pretty random. It did a pretty good job of this. But look at, big, look at it from a big data perspective. Put it into larger buckets and normalize it out. You can still go in and you can catch this stuff. Now, we also could look at things based on Session size. Attackers are jittering timing. We haven't seen anybody jittering session size yet. It might happen someday, but today it's not. So this is a valid technique you can go through and use. If you think about when a system calls home and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? And then it's told, no, go back to sleep. That, <clears throat> um, that communication has a certain command set associated with it, right? Do you have anything for me to do? Maybe literally that is the command that the compromise system sets. That's got a certain size associated with it. Well, that means that when this thing's calling home, saying, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. All those session size will be the same size. This is kind of neat because we can leverage that as figuring out, is it a beacon or not? And we can also identify, has that command and control channel actually been activated? So when it's calling home saying, do you have anything for me to do? And it's being told, no, go back to sleep. That's what we refer to as our heartbeat. 
And typically, that's going to be the smallest session size, you say. Not always, but usually. So notice we've got a bunch of connections, over 100,000 that took place, and they were all the same size. Well, this is all instances of the system checked in. There was no command for it to execute. See these other data points here? These are at least three instances where it called home and said, do you have anything for me to do? And it was given a different answer. It might have just been a connection check. Hey, I want to validate that I can still see the command prompt. It might have been, show me what files are in the local directory, run the task list command, whatever it is they wanted to do. Whatever it is they wanted to do resulted in more data being transmitted. So one of the cool things about session size analysis is it not only helps us figure out, is this a beacon or not, but it can also help us figure out, has this been activated? Are they using it? I saw a comment about this in Discord, and I want to expand on it a little bit, which is attackers are encrypting their data. Yeah, they do. In fact, what I see a lot of times now is they encrypt their data, and then they run it through HTTPS. So it's kind of getting double encrypted. This calls into question the usefulness of these outbound proxies that a lot of vendors are pushing. You know, there's vendors that are pushing these boxes that you buy from them and pay an insane amount of money that now all of your HTTPS sessions are supposed to go through this box. And what they will tell you is because it's going through our box, we'll strip off the HTTPS, HTTPS layer and tell you if there's anything malicious taking place. In other words, they'll strip off HTTPS and they'll do pattern matching. Oh boy, right? <laughs> now, here's the problem. If the attackers are encrypting their data, and then throwing and then wrapping HTTPS around it. What is this box seeing? Well, it's seeing ciphertext, right? It pulled off the first layer of encryption, but there's still another layer of encryption underneath it. So, how useful are those boxes? That was a question I had that I actually approached one of these vendors who will remain nameless because I don't want to get sued. But, you know, I went to the vendor at a show where they had a booth. And said, hey, so we've been seeing this. And you know, folks encrypt their data. Then they throw it through HTTPS. Are you seeing it too? Yeah, yeah, we've been running into that. Well, then what good is your box? And you know, all of a sudden there's a lot of backpedaling taking place. And the best answer I could get was, well, at least you're closer to the actual data because we're stripping off the HTTPS layer. I'm sorry, do you understand how encryption works? Because no, no, that's not how it works, right? It's not like, gee, my glasses are foggy. Let me wipe them off a little bit and they're still smeary, but at least now I can see a little bit. No, 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 that's not how encryption works. It's either a ciphertext or it's not. So if you're still showing me ciphertext and then you do pattern matching on the ciphertext, it's not like, you know, you're going to be, oh, well, we can pick up on where the letter A is now. No, 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 that's not how it works. So these boxes are frigging useless. In fact, the only things they're really doing is slowing down connections, right? Because now everything has to pass through that box. And oh, yeah, they're now a single point of security failure. Because what are they doing? They're decrypting all of your secure sessions on that box. If someone gets access to that box, you're completely friggin' hosed. It's not even like they got access to a single session. They have the keys to everything now. And you paid money to put that on your network. Oh, joy. So. These decryption boxes, needless to say, yeah, boxes never get compromised. Yeah, yeah, you're right, VT. We've never seen that happen before. So, um, so yeah. So pattern matching, trying to pull off HTTPS layer doesn't really help. One of the cool things, though, is we can still use session size analysis. For example, my heartbeat is, I'm going to call that around 90 bytes just to roll it off. What's our largest transfer size here? Based on the scale, I'm going to throw out a round number and say about 300 bytes. So imagine this is the data you have in front of you, and I'm your boss, and I come up to you and say, whoa, this system has our customer database on it that's one gig in size. Did they get that database? Did they exfiltrate that out of our network? You know, look me right in the eye and say, no, they didn't. Well, wait a minute, Chris. How, do, how can you prove that? Because the largest data transfer was 300 bytes. If you saw one gig, oh, yeah, all bets are off. They probably got that database. 
Or, hey, what's the database zip down to? 500 megs? Do you see a 500 meg transfer? Yeah, they may have got the database. One of the cool things about session size analysis is it can start giving you some insight into what's going on. So, for example, if I start seeing a lot of small jabbery sessions, that's usually indicative of lateral movement. Because think about what's lateral movement doing? I'm trying to do password guessing against multiple systems. I'm doing you know, network scanning. Is I'm going to do stuff that's going to cause a small amount of data to get exfiltrated out on a very regular basis out of the environment. So if I see that, that usually tells me they're moving laterally. If I start seeing big transfers, oh, they're grabbing data and pulling that out. So even though we can't see the data, we can get a pretty good idea of what's going on just by doing a size analysis. So safe listing. <clears throat> I mentioned this already. Not all persistence is evil. Could be time sync, could be checking for patches, something along those lines. One of the things that, so let's kind of talk about what does threat hunting normally look like, right? Let's say you're doing threat hunting for a living, right? Your company just said, whoa, hey, this threat hunting thing, we need to do this. You're now our threat hunter. <laughs> so uh, what does this look like when it starts? When it starts, it looks arduous. You're going to collect up a day's worth of data. It's probably going to take you three or four days to go through it. Because there's going to be a bunch of persistent connections that you need to spend a little time to look at and say, is there a business need for this or not? And you don't want to have to keep looking at them, right? Oh, this is just a system checking its time. Oh, it's just a system checking its time. Oh, it's just the system checking its time. You don't want to have that show up in every hunt. So what we do is we safe list things. We go in and we say, yes, this is a persistent connection, but there's a business need for it. It's trying to find, see if there's any new patches. I don't want this showing up in my threat hunt. So any good tool is going to give you the ability to go in and create a safe list entry for that that says, hey, if you spot this data pattern, don't show it to me. I don't care. And now your first hunt, quite honestly, is going through and creating a lot of these safe list entries. Now the second, so let's say, just to throw out round numbers, let's say your first hunt through a day's worth of data takes you four days. Your second hunt of a day's worth of data, it's probably only going to take you a day. Because you've safe listed a lot of the things that are on the network already. Your third hunt is probably only going to take you about eight hours. It's going to take you one work day. The next one after that might be a couple hours. After that, you're looking at new changes, and that's it. So if you do this process correctly, it's self-improving, it's self-correcting. By creating these safe list entries, we're actually reducing the amount of time it takes to do a hunt within that environment more and more and more, which is kind of neat. So identifying business need, like I said, that's, you know, second part of this process. Once we know it's persistent, I usually go in and try and figure out, is there, you know, can I figure out an obvious business need that's associated with this? Oh, and the purchasing group can be really helpful here. Right. Let's say I see a connection going out to Acme Corp and I can see they're a legitimate business, but I'm, I don't understand why we're connecting to that environment. I can go to the accounting group and say, hey, are we paying a Acme Corp for anything, for any services? And they may come back and say, oh, yeah, that was PO1573 that was done by the marketing team. Great. Now I go to the person who filed that PO on the marketing team and say, hey, what's going on with Acme Corp? Oh, we send them information about our prospects and they help us optimize our sales done. Great. There's a business need for that. We know we're okay now. <clears throat> so don't let this one by. A lot of times we tend to get hyper-focused on, can I figure it out using Google or network data? A lot of times talking to people can be super helpful too. Let's see. I wouldn't count. I wouldn't count on catching much with beacons, though. Even Cobalt Strike can be figured for wider, better uh, OPSEC. Our red teams used to just do things with normal channels. Yeah. So, all right. So, let's talk about that. So, there's kind of two things you can go looking for. You can go looking for red teams, or you can go looking for actual miscreants. What's the difference? Well, their motivations are different, right? What's a red team do? A red team breaks in, proves they could drop malware on the connect on the internal host, and then caches their paycheck. 
right? In other words, they don't need a functional C2 channel. The fact that they got the code there at all is all that matters. Now, what about an attacker? Oh, it's a little different. The attacker is going to actually be able to execute with that. Again, Sunburst, one of the most advanced nation state level attacks we've seen in the wild so far, was beaconing every 15 minutes. Why? Because they're going to be able to actually use that C2 channel. They're going to be do something with it. It's not enough to just get the malware on the system. They need to be able to make that channel useful. They're going to have a boss they report to that says, oh, you're into this us.gov environment. I want you to go looking for this information. It is an unacceptable answer to say, sure, I'll do that in three days when the, call, when the software calls home again. No, <laughs> no, unacceptable, right? That's a, good, that's a good way to find yourself doing a different job. But for a red teamer to say that, yeah, it's going off every three days. It's still a success. So in a lot of ways, it's actually harder to find red teams than it is actual attackers. Can you do stupid stuff with beacons that makes them unusable? Of course you can. But you're not going to find most actual malicious actors doing that in the wild. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so what tools can we leverage to kind of figure out what's going on you know, with this external host? Well, we need to run down what is that external host? You know, ASN information, geolocation information can kind of help with that. Uh, PTR records, you know, you get the idea. There's a lot of tools available to us to be able to go through and kind of run this down. Some helpful links. These are actually all built into the AC Hunter interface. We'll look at these a little bit later. But I like to include them here because a lot of us like the script stuff. So we could go through and actually script these and use variables for these locations where IP addresses show up to be able to retrieve information back. Um, keep in mind that these aren't always accurate. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. I'm not a big threat Intel fan, and I'll talk about why when we get into it. Okay, so we've used a couple of resources. We've talked to purchasing. We can't figure out a business need. What's our next step? Our next step is to go in and start looking at that protocol. Is there anything interesting going on that we can look at and say, you know, per the RFCs, that's legal, but something's wrong here, right? It's like having the evil bit turned on in the IP header. That shouldn't happen. Systems aren't, you know, the RFCs don't specifically state, thou shalt reject all packets that have the evil bit turned on. Yeah, it's kind of weird if it is turned on because most operating systems aren't going to do that by default. So there's an example of the system would continue to communicate perfectly normally. But wow, that's kind of weird. That's the type of stuff we want to go in and take a look at. One of the things I love about Zeek is it's application aware. And I mean really application aware. Most, and this, this really, burns my bridges. When, with, with most firewalls, when it tells you, oh, that user was doing HTTP to this website, what it's telling you is they was connecting to TCP port 80. And TCP port 80 is the well-known port for HTTP. So we're going to ask you, me, that it's HTTP traffic. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it's SSH. Unless you analyze the protocol, you don't know for sure. So one of the really cool things about Zeek is it makes no assumptions about what the protocol is on a given port. It does an application level analysis of all of them. So if traffic is going to TCP80, it expects to see, you know, user agent string, URIs being requested, a host parameter, maybe an X forwarded full field. It expects to see all the things that are related to HTTP traffic. If it sees, you know, Open SSH server 6.2, blah, 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 or get referred back. No, that's SSH. <laughs> that's not HTTP. And it will tell you that. So it will tell you, hey, that internal system was going to TCP port 80, but the application being used was SSH, not HTTP. And it's got about 55 different applications that it'll go through and understand. So anytime it sees a connection, it just runs through all of its checks to figure out which app it is. And if it can't match it against any of those, it'll print it out as an unknown protocol. 
So here's an example of that. <clears throat> so first time we're really kind of looking at the command line. So let me kind of talk this one through a little bit. So we've got, excuse me. So we've got um, cat con dot log. What does this mean? So Z creates a bunch of log files, right? And you can actually see that within the VM. So if you log into the VM, and I was just updating some patches on here, and type ls, it's going to show you a directory called labs. If I cd into that directory, and then type ls, you'll see there's three different lab directories. If I cd into lab1, and then type ls, you're going to see a bunch of Zeek logs. So this is the type of data that Zeek will go through and create when you have it go through and analyze network traffic. The main log that it uses is con.log. A copy of every session gets recorded to that log file. The rest of them depends on what type of traffic was taking place. So for example, http.log file is going to have additional information on all your HTTP sessions. DNS.log file, guess what it does? Guess, guess, guess. DNS information, you got that right. NTP, what do you think that does? NTP traffic, right, see, you get the idea. So con.log is always our main log. That's always the one that we're usually going to get started with. And then the rest of the logs we can go back and we can fall back on if we want to do a different additional protocol analysis. So let's go back to the slide off of that. <clears throat> so I'm saying cat con.log. So that would normally do is that would just print out all the data that's in the con.log file. Well, that's not very helpful seeing that scroll by on the screen very quickly, right? So I'm passing that output through an additional tool called ZCut. ZCut allows me to go and identify what data I actually want to see. So for example, you can follow along if you want. I'm going to type less space dash capital S dash X 20. Con.log. So less is like the more command on Windows. It allows me to page through a file. The difference is the less command, not only does page up and page down work, but the arrow keys work as well. Dash S says, don't line wrap. If a line is too long to fit on my screen, write it out past the right-hand side, and I'll just use the arrow keys to navigate over there if I want to. It just makes the file a lot easier to read. X20 says, I want each column to be 20 characters in width. That just kind of helps keep everything lined up correctly. So if I hit enter on this, <clears throat> here's what my con.log file looks like. Now, all of my column titles, unfortunately, get offset to the right by one. So TS is short for timestamp. This is my timestamp field. UID is short for unique identifier. This is my unique ID. ID.RRIG underscore H is Zeke nomenclature for source IP address, shown right here. Now, notice some of the stuff gets written off the right hand side because I use that dash capital S character uh, command. I can right arrow and scroll through everything else that's in this file. But you can see there's a lot of information in here. Each of them, like duration, has a column title. So if I want to see how long did the connection run for, duration will tell me that. If I want to see how many bytes was sent by the client to the server, I can see that. How many bytes came back from the server to the client, I can see that. So I've got a bunch of column titles in here to work with. So what this command is doing <clears throat> is it's saying pull out the source IP address pull out the destination IP address, the destination port, the protocol, TCP, UDP, ICMP, whatever the case may be, the service, hey, Zeke, I want you to try to decode what application was using this port number, and then how many bytes went from the client to the server, how many bytes went from the server to the client, and then column-t just kind of cleans up the output. And then I pump it through head, so it only shows me the first 10 lines. So what this is showing me is when this IP address was talking to this IP address, it was going to TCP port 80. Here was the protocol that was identified. Now notice this one going to TCP 80 was identified as HTTP, as was this. This one was not. 
Why not? So a little bit of a clue when we look at the amount of data that went back and forth. 80 bytes were sent, 40 bytes was returned. That, to me, sounds like the client tried to connect and then killed the connection with the reset packet. In other words, 80 bytes is my IP header, my TCP header, and that's about it. So this may have been just a connection check type of thing, or like an NMAP scan or something weird like that. But notice we've got our protocols being identified, which makes this super easy to go through and do. So AC Hunter presents that under the COM section. So you may see, you know, TCP 443 SSL. Sometimes it'll say TCP uh, 443 TCP SSL and then a dash. What does that mean? That means that all the traffic was going to TCP 443. Some of them we didn't see, you know, the um, SS, the SSL client hello go from the client. We didn't see the server return a digital certificate. Typically, those are indicative of, hey, the client tried to connect and the server rejected the connection. So you might actually see more than one thing listed like that. Unexpected protocol use. So this is, um, you know, like I said, it doesn't break the RFCs, but it kind of bends them. And here's a great example of that. One of the things you can do is you can tunnel C2 channels over DNS traffic. And it's really stealthy and it's really effective. And they do it without breaking any of the DNS rules. But they're bending certain rules that we can actually use from a behavioral perspective to go in and detect when this is taking place. Let me talk about how this works. <clears throat> so imagine I'm this attacker. And I drop some malware on the system, yet another successful phishing attack or whatever the case may be. And I don't want to call back to the C2 server directly because I'm afraid if I do, you may notice traffic going to a new IP address that you've never seen before. And you might detect that the system's compromised because of that. So here's what I do instead. I'm going to leverage DNS. So what I do is I go out and I register a domain name. For the sake of this example, let's say I register evil.com. Well, when you create a domain, you've got to identify what are your authoritative name servers for that domain, right? I identify my command and control servers as the authoritative servers for my domain. Why do I do that? Oh, it'll become apparent in just a second. So now when this compromised system wants to call home, I simply have a query something within that domain I registered. That gets sent to the local resolver. The local resolver says, oh, I don't have this information in cache. Let me go out to the root name servers. Root name servers are directing me to these other name servers to resolve anything within .com. And then when I go to the .com servers, the .com servers tell me, oh, for anything in, for, that's part of evil.com, go to this server right here. <clears throat> so now this query gets sent to that server by the internal resolver. When it does that, this is basically super, you know, super secret code to tell the compromise uh, to tell the C2 server, hey, the system making this query is one of a, is a compromised host. It's calling in, identifying itself to see do you have anything for it to do. And again, the attacker could say, run the task list command. The answer that comes back would be a coded message that says, run the task list command. Further queries might actually exfiltrate that data out, or it might create a new channel for that. Depends on the C2 that's being used. But you get the idea. This is all going through DNS. So if I'm watching what's going on at my firewall level, what I see is my DNS server doing DNS queries. But does that all day long anyway, right? That isn't going to raise any red flags. So this is an easy way to be able to kind of sneak out of an environment, and do it in a way that the environment may not actually pick up on it. Now, because, so let me back up for a sec. Now, they're bending the DNS rules, but they can't break them. What if this system does this exact same query again to try to identify, hey, I'm here, I'm in a compromised state, come and, you know, come and give me commands to execute. Well, if this query gets sent to that resolver, that resolver might say, ah, I have that information in cache. 
I'm going to hand back a cached answer because that should be perfectly fine. And now it's just broken the C2 channel. Well, Chris, can't the attacker go in and say TTL zero? And that tells resolvers not to catch the information. Ah, hey, great question. Glad you thought of that. And yes, it sort of does. But one of the things you can do with a resolver is you can set a minimum TTL time. And most folks do this, right? Why have all these queries going out over your link all the time? You know, if somebody sets the TTL to zero, so they'll set some minimal time interval, one minute, five minutes. I used to set 10 minutes. Right. So if a TTL comes in set for less than 10 minutes, remember it for 10 minutes anyway. That's going to reduce the number of queries going out over the internet and it isn't going to break anything. So the attacker knows they can't use the same query over and over again, or the resolver might just start handing back cached information. So they need to change this query every single time. So now my compromise system is querying a brand new resource every single time within that remote domain. Well, this kind of begs a question. How many resource records does it make sense for, an inv- for the typical environment to expose to the internet? And the answer is not many, 10 or less. Because really, how many DNS records are you going to have? You can have a web server, mail server, a couple of DNS servers, you know, maybe a DKIM record. You know, hey, look, we're still counting on one hand. We haven't even run into the second set of fingers yet. So... For most environments, that number is 10 or less. Now, for some of these larger environments that offer internet services, like Akamai, like Google, like Amazon, everybody's heard of them. I don't have to tell you what Amazon does for business. You already know. I don't have to tell you what Akamai does. You already know. Microsoft, the same thing. So they may actually have a couple hundred resource records that they're advertising out to the internet. But again, you've heard of them. You know who they are. So you might see something in a couple of hundreds. So anything over an, a thousand, really suspicious. Anything over a couple of dozen or one you don't recognize, also really suspicious. So here's a behavioral pattern we can key in on to help find C2 over DNS. Oh, well, Chris, all you need to do is look for text record queries, right? If somebody's doing a lot of text record queries, that's C2 over DNS. Maybe, maybe not. I've seen C2 over DNS use MX records, uh, C names, my personal favorite, DKIM records. Why? Because DKIM is a protocol we came up with to make DNS more secure. And there's a twisted side of me that kind of gets a kick out of the fact that the attackers figured out how to leverage that against us and use it for creating C2 channels instead. So if you only look for text records, you're going to miss stuff. Pattern matching doesn't work. But the behavioral analytics will be the same regardless of whether it's text, CNAME, MX, or whatever the case may be. So one of the things we can look for is just a large number of resource records. So for example, actually, I think the default data set has this in there. Yes, it does. So let's look at this real quick. So up here, it's telling me two potential C2 over DNS cases detected. So if I go down here, there's a DNS module. I'm going to open that up. And it's flagging these first two listings here. What's this data telling me? This is telling me that we looked up 62,468 resource records within r-1x.com. Okay, r-1x.com. I've never heard of them. So I'm expecting 10 or less. Oh, 62,000 plus. Gee, that doesn't make sense. <clears throat> they're not breaking any DNS rules, but they're certainly bending them, right? So that makes these highly interesting to me. Now, the other thing I can go through and I can look for is I can look for utilization. For example, AkaDNS.net, that's Akamai. We looked up 125 unique resource records. Okay, Akamai is the largest content delivery network in the world. The fact that we looked up 125 resource records does not surprise me in the least. So it's not the quantity of this number that is interesting to me at all. This looks perfectly fine. But let's look at utilization. I had three internal IP addresses that did DNS queries within AkaDNS.net. 
That resulted in 13 different systems making multiple connections to one or more of those 125 resource records. Well, that makes sense, right? That's kind of how DNS works, right? The user types something into the link of their browser. DNS resolves that to an IP address, and then we connect to that IP address. We connect to that resource. So this is how I expect DNS to work. Well, let's go back to that first entry. <clears throat> I have one system doing DNS queries. That is the only system accessing this domain. So that begs the question, why did I need to look up 62,000 resource records when none of my users needed to access any of those resources? Again, this doesn't break the DNS communication rules, but it's certainly bending them, right? That's, that isn't a logical thing to have happen. That's something that makes it worth further investigation. So it's that kind of understanding how these protocols work and knowing what is highly abnormal can really help you go in and kind of run this stuff down. And you got slide caps here for the stuff that we just talked about. All right. So with this one, so my user agent string is my system's way of identifying itself via HTTP. So when I go to talk to a remote web server, and I'm using you know, unencrypted HTTP, I'm sharing my user agent string, and that's identifying um, typically what browser is being used, what operating system I'm on. Um, sometimes you can enumerate what patches are out of this. A lot of times you can enumerate if there's any uh, additional capabilities built in, like you know, you'll support Office documents or that type of thing. So it's just a way for the system to go through and identify itself. This command here is going through and looking at http.log. It's using zcut to pull out the source IP, the destination IP, and the user agent string. So the user agent string is these things here. This is the system uniquely identifying itself. And then what I'm doing is I'm looking for one source IP address only, and I'm going through and manipulating the data to count up how many different IP addresses was this user agent string used? So in other words, when I talked to 15 different IPs out on the internet, this was the user agent string I used. For 12 different IPs, this was the user agent string. For one, this was the user agent string I used. Well, wait a minute. This claims it's a Windows 10 system. This claims it's a Windows 10 system. So in 27 cases, I claim to be Windows 10. But then I talked to one specific IP and said, hi. I'm Windows uh, I'm Windows running Microsoft Internet Explorer version 7 running on Windows XP running Java version 1.5. What? Wait a minute. I thought you were Windows 10. Now, there is an edge case that could explain this. What if somebody is running Windows 7 in a VM? That could do this, right? How often does that happen? Not very right? That this is an extreme edge case that somebody might be doing this. And if they are, you already know it. In other words, maybe there's some internal weird mainframe app thing you use that only talks to Windows 7 for some strange reason. And you got to run Windows 7 in a VM in order to be able to talk to it. You're going to know that already. But you know what? Those connections are going to be going to other internal systems, not out to the internet like this. So. Again, this doesn't break any internet rules, but it's certainly bending them. And it's bending them in a way that is, doesn't make sense from a legitimate communication standpoint. There's no legitimate reason why I should normally identify as Windows 10, but oh no, today I'm going to be Windows 7. You know, that doesn't make any sense. And you can do the same thing with JA3 hashes. JA3 hashes are a hash of the SSL client hello packet. So in the SSL client hello, a system will identify, this is what I want to use for asymmetric encryption. This is what I want to use for symmetric encryption. This is what I want to use for data privacy. These are the different algorithms I support. And this is the order I want to support them. Are we going to have another break in four minutes? Yes, we are. So this is the order I want to support them in. That 
so uh, J, J3 just goes through and hashes all that information. Again, I would expect in a, a hash that's normally associated with the operating system I'm running. If I see one that's associated with a different operating system or doesn't jive with any hash that's normally created by the operating system I'm using, oh, that's a problem. Somebody's bending the rules. That's worth going in and taking a look at. Now, once we do a protocol analysis, now we're down to looking at the internal system. And what data is available really depends upon the tools that we have at, uh, at our disposal. Maybe we have system logging take place. Maybe we don't. If we don't, we, don't obvi we obviously don't have this to fall back on. But if we do, at least we have some context to go through it with, right? Hey, I'm seeing this system. Talk to this host out on the internet, and it's happening during these timeframes. Well, now that gives me some queries to go in and do within my system logs to be able to identify what's going on on that box during that time while it's trying to talk to that system. That may help me figure out what's actually taking place on that internal host. And like I said, Sysmon is a great tool for this. So Sysmon is a Microsoft tool. It doesn't ship with Windows. You got to download it off the Microsoft site. It's created by the Sys Internals group. But it'll, if you collect just ID3s, ID3s are applications talking on the network. So that is the system reaching out to a remote host or a remote host talking to an active server on that system. This is the type of data you get. You know, what app create is do is talking on the network? What source IP port was used? What destination IP port was used? And we can go back and we can reference this. So if I see my system talking to some IP address out on the internet, I can leverage this information to go back and refer to what application was creating that connection. And if I look at this app and say, oh, yeah, I recognize that app. There's a business need for this app. We're good to go. If I look at it and say, oh, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Oh, we're probably going to need to go further down the rabbit hole, right? But like I said, what's nice about Beaker is it's an open source tool. Anybody can download and use it. It's by only connecting ID3s, it's the minimal performance hit on those endpoints. It's the minimal performance hit to the network. We're not, trans we're not trying to transmit every little friggin' thing each host is doing, just apps on the network, and that's it. This also makes our database small. So our queries, our filters, our searches all run faster because we're not trying to sludge through as much information. And it gives us what we need. Hey, if I'm seeing this IP address talking to that IP address persistently over a period of time, and it's telling me Notepad is doing that, oh, I'm scared, right? Because <laughs> Notepad doesn't talk on the network. Not the Notepad I'm thinking of anyway. This is some other Notepad that shouldn't be on that system. Now, what's kind of cool about this is... Would you, you know, we, we write SIM rules looking to see uh, people running PowerShell, right? We know to do that. Did Marion Accounting run PowerShell? If so, that might be a problem because Marion Accounting normally doesn't run PowerShell. Are you going to write a SIM rule to look for people running Notepad? No, it's got a false positive constantly, right? If you did set this up, you'll probably shut it off in a day or two because it's just giving you a lot of useless information. But here we have context, right? This system is talking to that system, and this is the application causing it to take place. This behavioral characteristic that this application that normally doesn't connect on the network all of a sudden is, tells me this is not the application I think it is. Something else is going on. So again, being able to extract out this type of information as part of a threat hunt can be super useful. But I have no system locks. Yeah, maybe it's time to get some. And with that, let's take our break. So it's top of the hour. This is our second 10-minute break. At 10 minutes after the top of whatever hour it is in your time zone, we'll pick up from here and keep going. Talk to you in about 10 minutes. All right, so we have about a minute before we'll get started, but I wanted to hit a couple of the questions. Uh, one of them was, hey, so... TCP 80 doesn't have to be HTTP. It can be anything. Yeah, it all comes down to how, what you bind ports to. So, for example, uh, an SSH server normally listens on TCP 22. 
What a lot of folks do is they bind it to a different port. That keeps the script kiddies, you know, SSH is the most abused port on the internet, uh, at least the last stats that I looked at. Everybody is trying, you know, common logins to see if they can't get access to a server they shouldn't be getting access to. So if you have SSH open and listening on 22 and you like to go through your logs, there's a ton of script kitty crap in there that quite honestly, you don't care about. Because they're trying a couple of simple passwords, and so long as you're using public-private keys or you know very good passwords, it's never going to be an issue. But you end up with all this crap in your logs you just don't care about. So if you take your SSH server and let's say bind it to port 2022 instead, now so long as people know they got to connect on this alternate port, it works perfectly fine. All the script kiddies keep beating away at port 22 and they don't find it, and that's fine. If you do find something interesting in your logs, oh, that is definitely worth paying attention to because they figured out you have SSH running on an alternate port. So yeah, um, I've done that environments before. So what I used to do was I worked in an environment that will remain nameless, that was fairly locked down, that limited what outbound ports would work, and SSH was not one of them. So what I used to do was just set up a server to listen on TCP 443. And what they would see is a log entry that said Chris was using HTTPS, and that was an acceptable protocol, so they were happy. But that was because their firewall wasn't actually analyzing the application layer, and I was connecting to an SSH server. And my SSH worked, so I was happy, and they were happy. They saw the log entries they wanted. So clearly, there was absolutely nothing wrong with me circumventing policy because everybody was happy. So what could possibly be wrong with that, right? I'm kidding. Uh, let's see. There's another question in here. When will there be a level two class? Uh, there's actually the advanced class. Bill gave a link to that. Thank you, Bill. Um Some sock stuff, yeah. I need to learn how to network better or something. Yeah, so so it depends on how you mean network. If you mean network socially, I will say the community that has kind of sprung up around threat hunting is one of the best I've ever seen. For the folks that are like old, like me, right? And I'll call out Bill. Bill is old too. We remember many, many different forums where, you know, you would ask a question and the common response was read the manual or, oh my God, I can't believe you have this job and don't know the answer to that question. Or, you know, basically you were getting, you were getting answers that were designed to stroke the person who's answering's ego, not actually help you with your problem. This community has been really good at kind of recognizing that, Hey, you know, we all start somewhere. And we don't all know everything. And the way to learn more is to share information with each other. I have in the, in the, so we've had probably about 35,000 people go through this class. In that time, I have seen one person try and do the read the manual thing. And oh, they were shamed so quickly, they decided never to come back. So if you're talking about social networking, this is a cool group to do it with. The, uh, the coffee shop channel. Is a great place to go in and just chat with people. And last time I was in there, we were talking about cars and, you know, and what, you know, car design and tires and that type of thing. And, you know, stuff that has nothing to do with this, but it's perfectly fine. You can meet some good folks that way. If it's learn more about networking, meaning, you know, protocols and stuff like that, um, I do have that Packadico class coming up, you know, shameless plug coming. Um, there's a link to it in the beginning of the slides. Um, that's a pay what you can class. So you can get in for like 25 bucks or actually you can take it for free. Um, if you go in, there's a way to go in and tell it, Hey, I need financial aid and they'll, they'll go in, they'll let you go in and take that class for free. So that would be my suggestion for that. Unless you've decided you've heard too much of my voice because I teach that class too. Although I hope my voice will be better by that. All right. With that said, let's just jump back in. So. We covered looking for connection persistency. We talked about identifying, is there a business need associated with that? We said, okay, if we can't identify a business need, let's do a deep dive on the protocol. If we do a deep dive on the protocol and we're still not really sure, 
maybe we can pull logs off the internal host or something along those lines to help us through. So the idea is to collect as much information as we can without ever crossing that passive active line that we talked about earlier to figure out, is it safe or is it something we need to trigger incident response mode? Now, you may still not know. There's a third option. I'm not sure. And if you're not sure, the answer is the the output of that can't be meh, eff it, right? No, it needs to be what do I need to know to know for sure? Maybe it's I need to collect additional data. Maybe I need to do full PCAP captures off of this one host. Maybe that's the way to go. But assuming you've got enough data to work with, which hopefully you should at this point, you can, you're now in a good position to say add it to a safe list because I know it's okay, or we need to go in incident response mode. All right, so let's talk about some tools. So these are tools that you that can help you as part of your threat hunting process. I like to talk about TCP dump. This has been around forever. Um, it's a very basic tool, but one of the cool things you can really do with this is capture packets. So if I want to do full PCAP captures, either that's because this is what I'm doing to record all network traffic, or I've seen something interesting and I want even more details about what's going on. So I'm going to generate a full PCAP. TCP dump is a great tool for this. It's very lightweight. It doesn't add a whole lot of load to the box. Um, this can be super useful for, hey, I'm seeing C2 over DNS take place, but the source IP I'm seeing is my internal resolver. And I'm pretty sure that's not the system compromised. It's some host using it as a resolver that's responsible for that. Well, I can go to that DNS server and I can run TCP dump, start capturing sessions and grab that information that way. This little script at the bottom is the is uh, thanks to our illustrious Bill Stearns. So what this does is it creates a directory called PCAP, and then it goes through and it runs TCP dump, and it, once an hour, it writes out a PCAP file that has the host name, date, time, stamp associated with it as part of the file name. And then it'll do that again for the next hour, and the next hour, and so on. So now if I know something happened at you know 2 a.m. last night, it's just a matter of going in and finding the right file, and now I can go in and do a full analysis on that. And, it, and this goes through, and it even compresses it. T Shark is another one that's been around for a while. So most of most of you are probably familiar with its complement, Wireshark, right? A lot of folks like Wireshark. I think Wireshark is an awesome tool. It's not the best threat hunting tool. Why? There's a lot of overhead with it. I'll talk more about that when I talk about Wireshark, but T Shark is actually pretty cool. So, this is a command line tool. It's kind of similar to TCP dump. But what I like about T Shark over TCP dump is you get a lot more control over the output. TCP dump shows you what it's going to show you. There's a little bit of manipulation you can do. You can, you know, dash capital X, show me the full packet hex, um, you know, dash V, VVV, show me more verbose output. But you kind of get what you get. You don't get a whole lot of control about over that. One of the nice things about T Shark is I can use dash T fields to specify the exact data I want to say. So, for example, if all I want to see is DNS queries, I could run a command similar to this. And now anything that's not a DNS query packet, it just ignores it. Anything that is a DNS query packet, it's going to print out what was the user trying to get to. We don't have the answer to the question here, but we at least see the query. If we wanted the answer, there's another field we could add in for that. But you get the idea. One of the nice things about T Shark is I can focus in on just the data I actually care about. So here's an example where I'm reading a PCAP file. That's what the dash R does. And I'm using dash T fields to say, show me the user agent string. And only look at traffic going to TCP port 80. Well, here's my user agent strings. So this is extracting out the user agent strings directly from the packets as they go by. Now, what's the sort unique sort doing here? A lot of times I don't want to just see the raw data. I want to maybe see quantities of the data, right? And things like that. So what this first sort does is it sorts 
all the user agent strings so that when they're the same, they show up one line after the other. Unique C says, don't print out all of the lines that match, right? So let's say I have 10 instances of something. Unique C says, instead of printing out 10 lines, only print out one line. But dash C means add the number 10 at the beginning so that when I look at that data, I know there was 10 lines before, but now it's only printing out the one. So that helps to collapse the data down. And it makes it easier if I'm trying to keep track of how many times was this particular thing seen, it adds it all up for me very simply. And then sort dash RN simply means that number that got appended at the beginning. Dash N means it's a numeric value. Sort by that value. So it's going to sort lowest to highest. So out of this particular sample PCAP, I had two instances of this being the user agent string. Two where this was the user agent string, three where this was, and so on down. So this would so if I wanted to see what are the most common user agent strings being used, what are the least common, this might be an easy way to go in and just pull that right out of the raw data. Cap Infos is a tool that ships with T Shark. So when you install T Shark, you get Cap Infos. Cap Infos doesn't show you what's in the PCAP, but it gives you a lot of really good information about that PCAP. When was the PCAP created? What was the line speed? What was the you know, average number of packets going by while this thing was being run? Um, when was the packet capture started? When was it ended? And so on. So it'll give you a lot of good and really, really good information about that PCAP file. Now, if I add in some switches like AEU, I can pull out specific pieces of information. So dash A allows me to see, um, I think that's my duration time, right? My, my EU is identifying when it was the first packet in that packet capture, when was the last packet in that packet capture. Why is this a threat hunting tool? Well, remember we said more data better, right? So let's say somebody gives me a PCAP file and says, hey, I need you to analyze this. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and run CAP infos. Why? Because if this is a 10-minute capture, now I know I can't look for long connections, right? Because there's only 10 minutes of data here. I can look for beacons, but now I'm going to tell the person, hey, caveat here. The only beacons I can find in a 10-minute period of time are ones that are going off a lot, you know, like once per second. We need more data to be able to get a more accurate read on whether there's any beacons in here at all type of thing. So that's what CAP Infos is good for. Is it's good for giving you a, um, a, a good summary of what that PCAP information is. And then there's Wireshark. Like I said, a lot of us have used this to go in and try and look at some packets. Wireshark is a great tool. A couple of challenges with Wireshark. Number one, you've got to load the whole PCAP into memory first. When we're talking about threat hunting, we're talking about grabbing everything going by on the link. Those files can be huge. You know, 50, 60, 70 gigs is not on that, is not that uncommon. If I've got a 50, 60 gig PCAP file, and I try to load that on Wireshark on my Windows system with 8 gigs, what do you think happens? A lot of disk thrashing, right? Because we can't fit the whole PCAP into RAM. There's not enough space for it. So it's gonna, uh, most of it is going to end up going out to swap. So everything is going to run really slowly. So what I like Wireshark for is, hey, there is this session or there's this connection pair that I want to do a deep analysis on. I never use Wireshark for, hey, let's see if we can't find anything interesting in all the network traffic that's going by. There's other tools that are better for that. Zeek, T-Shark, you name it. They're much better for doing that. But when you get down to analyzing, you know, like I said, one pair or one session, that's when Wireshark really shines. Zeek, I've talked about. This is my favorite threat hunting tool. Z goes through and gives us a summary of every session that takes place on the network. We looked at the con.log file a little bit earlier. So you could see it had a lot of good stats in it, like, hey, where was the connection coming from? Where was it going to? 
how many bites went each way? You know, what were the packets? How many packets got sent each way? It'll tell us that. What was the, what was the flag state? The flag state is just simply, you think about your TCP three packet handshake, or excuse me, a TCP session in general. It starts with that three packet handshake. Then it goes into an established state. And then a fin exchange or a reset packet is going to end it at the end. Zeek will keep track of all that and tell you what was seen for flags. So Zeek is a really good tool to use uh, as part of our thread hunting uh, stuff. Here's another good example. So I'm saying cat SSL dot star or cat SSL star. So what this is saying is for all the SSL dot log files in the current directory, I want to go in and do some processing on. It. I'm sending them through Zcut and I'm saying pull out the source IP, the destination IP, the destination port, and the validation status of the digital certificate and look for anything where the validation status is self-signed. So what this allows me to do is quickly look at how many of my users and how often are talking to servers that have a self-signed digital certificate. That's what this is pulling out for. Pretty cool. You can also very quickly figure out, was the digital certificate okay? Who's talking to invalid digital certificates? So if I want to go in and you know take a look for that, this is a real easy way to go through and do that. Does Zeek need much space? It doesn't use a lot. Well, so Zeek, it depends on uh, how busy your network traffic is. A good rule of thumb is capture some PCAPs, right? Capture some PCAPs and then figure out how much storage would this use in a day. And a lot of times that number is going to be pretty huge, right? It might end up being like 10 gigs. Zeek is usually going to use about 1 20th that amount of storage. So to kind of put that into perspective, imagine I had enough disk storage to store five days worth of PCAPs. Well, five days isn't much. I got to be on my game, right? If I figure out a system got compromised, but it happened 10 days ago, well, those PCAPs are only go already gone. I only got five days worth of information to work with. In that same amount of storage, I could keep 100 days, possibly 200 days worth of Zeke logs. That's a whole lot better, right? To have 100 days worth of data to fall back on. So now if I don't catch something for a week, Zeke's going to have some data on it that I can fall back to. So for what it does, it's pretty efficient. But how much disk space it's going to use depends on how much bandwidth you're pushing. A um, couple of switches you can use if you're using Zcut. Dash D changes that timestamp from being epoch format to being human readable. That might be helpful. Although I will point out that notice the resolution isn't as good. In other words, I can see that this packet, or this session happened after this session because of the timestamps. Down here, I can't really tell the difference between the two. Also, keep in mind, just because one line is below another doesn't mean it's going to have a higher timestamp to it. Well, why, Chris? Wouldn't it write these in in order? It does. It writes them in in order based on when the connection's closed, not when they started. So if I have a connection that lasts 10 minutes, all the connections that started and stopped within that 10-minute period of time are going to show up in the logs first. So, you know, again, the epoch time gives us a little bit of visibility on that. But it is harder to read. Now, there's another tool out there, and I got to update slides to reflect this tool. I think we're going to start using this one in this class. Zcutter. It's a Python script. This was written by our illustrious Bill Stearns. One of the drawbacks of Zcut is Zcut only works with Zeek logs that are in CSV format, that comma, or that space separated format, like we were looking at. Zeek has another option which is to save logs in JSON form. And if I'm going to feed it into another system, sometimes the JSON format's a little bit better. The problem is Zcut doesn't work with them. So I can make logs that are easy for people to work with, or I can make logs that are easy for systems to work with. You can't do both with the default tools. Well, with Zcutter, I can extract out fields out of that 
JSON format just as easily as CSV. In fact, one of the things that's kind of cool is I can parse multiple logs at the same time. Further, some of those logs could be in JSON format, some of them could be in CSV, and Zcutter will handle all of them just happily, no problem. So this is a really cool tool that Bill went through and created for us. That's a link to go grab it if you want to play around with it. In fact, I think it's on the VM as well. Bill also wrote this tool, Passer. So Passer is kind of a neat tool to keep track of what's actually going on within your environment and give you that data in a summary format. So it can tell you what ports are open on a system, not by doing a port scan, but by seeing which ports are actually responding to people, right? So if someone sends a packet to TCP80 on a system and it gets back a SYNAC, Passer me knows that means that system is listening on TCP port 80. So it can give you that type of information. It'll also go through and try and do some uh, simple passive enumeration to figure out what is that system? Is there a DNS record that was queried that's associated with it? In which case I can tell you what its fully qualified domain name is. Is it sending out multicast packets to advertise what it is? In which case I can leverage that information to tell you what that host is. So if you, you know, you're in a situation where a system gets compromised, one of the first things to start with is what is that system? Passer is a great way to be able to go in and kind of get a quick handle on, oh, it's identifying itself as Windows. It has these ports open. You know, it can kind of help you expedite that whole threat hunting process. Smudge is a tool that uh, we created not too long ago. There used to be a tool called P0F which was short for Passive Fingerprinting Tool. So the concept is, if you look at a TCP SYN packet, there are nuances in that packet that differentiate one operating system from another. I'll give you a sim very simple example. TTL, time to live, byte eight within the IP header. The RFC state, the TTL must be one byte. It doesn't say what value needs to be expressed in that byte when the packet is first sent, meaning what starting TTL should that system use? And different vendors have picked different things. So for example, Windows has always used 128 as a starting TTL. Cisco devices have always used 255. Uh, Linux, Unix systems, uh, later Macs all use 64. Older Macs used to use 32. So by looking at the TTL of a packet, that gives me a clue as to what that operating system might be. And there's a lot of other fields that I won't get into within the TCP header to help me figure out that information. P0F was a great tool for that. The problem is it was created like 15 years ago and was it hasn't really been updated. So we wanted that capability back. So we created this tool called Smudge. Smudge does passive fingerprinting. So it'll look at that SYN packet and give you an idea of what is that operating system that was generating that packet. Again, this can be a great way to, if you don't know a lot about your internal systems, this may be a great way to go through and be able to learn that. And what's nice is it's passive. Nmap will do fingerprinting as well, but Nmap has to send a lot of very suspicious looking packets to that endpoint in order to figure it out. Smudge does it just by watching the traffic going by. It's completely invisible to both endpoints. NGREP is kind of like GREP for the network. So if you're not familiar with GREP, GREP is like fine string on the Windows side. So GREP allows you to specify a pattern, and it will search a file looking for that pattern. And when it finds that pattern, it will print out the entire line. Well, with NGREP, I can define a pattern to look for inside of packets. And when it finds that pattern, it prints out a summary of that packet. So for example, here I'm saying, hey, ngrep, I want you to read odd.pcap and look for the character string capital A D M I N. And anytime you see that in a packet, print it out. And it's saying, oh, hey, I saw a TCP packet coming from this source IP, this source port, this destination IP, this destination port. The ACK and the push flag was set within the TCP header. And in the payload of the packet, was this big long string, which included that ADMIN that you told me to go in and look for. 
Here's another instances of that showing up in the payload. This is an awesome, awesome tool to use for running down C2 over DNS. So I talked about you could use TCP dump on your uh, DNS server to figure out you know, which internal system is actually making those queries that are responsible for C2. The problem, of course, and I mentioned TCP dump because that's installed on all Linux and Unix systems by default. And there's a Windows complement for that called Window. So it's pretty easy to get up and get running. The downside is you're going to get everything. And then you're going to have to sift through that to look for just the pattern that you wanted to find. Well, you could do that, excuse me, directly with Engra. So if all these packets were going to the evil.com domain, I could just tell Ngrep, hey, look at my UDP 53 traffic for evil.com. And now everybody who did that query is going to show up in the output. Kind of a cool tool. You implying people run Nmap without authorization? Of course not. No, that's not what I'm implying. What I'm implying is smudge is so much freaking cooler. Because if you run Nmap, I may see it. If someone's running smudge, there's no fingerprint left behind. Because it's a passive tool. Passive tools to me, personally, are always much cooler than active tools. Then there's Rita. So Rita was a tool we came out with about five, six years ago. It was an open source tool. Rita is designed to look at large numbers of connections and identify, is there any connection persistency in here that you may want to go in and pay attention to? <laughs> Explain much cooler in management language. <laughs> awesome, Jesse. <laughs> That's awesome. Um. Less likely to break things. How about that in management lingo? So Rita takes uh, data input. We prefer Zeek. It'll work with NetFlow and a few other tools, but you really want to be using Zeek because it has much better resolution. But it'll read Zeek logs, and it'll tell you, hey, in these Zeek logs, are there any instances of connection persistency that might be worth a deeper look? So for example, here I'm saying, hey, Rita, Look at the lab one data set and show me any beacons that might show up there. And read is going to give you output kind of similar to this. <clears throat> this first column is the most important because it is a score rating of how beacony was this session. One is a perfect beacon. Anything off of that is a percentage. So one is, hey, we're 100% certain this persistency of connection. For the second connection, we were only 83.8% .8 certain it was persistency of connection. After the score, you get the source IP, the destination IP. You get the count, how many connections took place. After that, you see the average byte size that's being transferred. After that, there's a bunch of other data that, quite honestly, from a threat hunting perspective, you don't need to worry about. We include that so that we can make improvements to the tool later. So for example, let's say you found a C2, uh, C2 running on your network using Rita, and Rita scored that as a 75%. And you look at that and you say, hey guys, so you scored this a 75%, but this was a malicious beacon. I think it should have had a higher score than that. The first thing we're going to ask you to do, copy this whole line and send us that. Because that's going to tell us what were the attributes of that session that caused that score to get generated. And we may look at that and say, you know, oh, hey, you know, yeah, you're right. We didn't weight this particular field high enough, or we didn't weight this particular attribute the right way. Well, let's go in and let's make a change for that. Or, hey, we've never seen C2 like this before. This was unexpected. You know, great, we caught it, but you're right, we can do better. Let's say, make some changes to the back end math to make sure that that score is higher in the future. So, everything after the average session size, you know, from here over is more for troubleshooting than anything else. And Beacon and Reed has got a lot of different things it goes through and checks. We'll go through and we'll talk about those as we go through. And then there's AC Hunter Community Edition. So this is basically Rita with a graphic front end and safe listing built in. Those are really the big differences between the two. I think I got a chart here somewhere. 
There's a chart here somewhere that talks about the difference between like AC Hunter Enterprise and Community Edition. Um, but what this tool is designed to do is to make it even easier to go through and find which systems need attention. So for example, with Rita, I'd have to go in and look for beacons, and I might have to do a couple of searches, and then I got to go and look for long connections, then I got to go in and look for open connections. Well, with AC Hunter, we assign a score. So you know what systems to go in and pay attention to first. You know, oh, this has the biggest score, therefore that's the one I need to go in and watch for first. Over on the right, we identify where are those points coming from. So for example, this first one here that's highlighted, there was an IP-based beacon that was taking place that generated a score of 94 points. Okay, great. Now I know there's an IP-based beacon there. I need to go in and dig in a little bit deeper. If I click on the second one, dot fifty-five, this output will change. And now I'll get to see, okay, where did that score come from there? So we've tried to kind of optimize the workflow of figuring out uh, what you need to pay attention to. The story behind Reader is so lovely too. Yeah. So Reader is named after John Strand's mom, uh, who was an awesome person. Uh, very cool sense of humor to her. She must, right? She raised John. Uh, there is a Darknet Diaries. I forget the exact episode number. If someone knows it or can look it up and post it in the chat, that would be awesome. Uh, but there's a Darknet Diaries episode where John did a uh, red team exercise. He was hired by a prison. And his mom stepped in and said, I can do this. I can compromise their network. <laughs> I used to be a lunch lady. I can compromise their network. And she was successful. But the Dark Knight Diaries is all about uh, John Strand's mom, Rita, uh, compromising a um, <clears throat> correctional facility, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. It's a great story. So, And a couple of folks have posted the, uh, the big house. Yep, that was it. Thank you. Definitely listen to that episode. It's really cool. The beacon screen, we talked about this. You know, we talked about here's our, uh, you know, my X axis is time, 24 hours, Y axis is quantity, how many connections are taking place. Notice this one, this here. So this is my how often was a certain delta time seen. Notice usually this is going off every second or less than a second. But it kind of trails off occasionally too, which is kind of an interesting attribute to have. You can see what modules loaded, what the date time is. I talked about this analysis already. Um, time interval count. So what this is talking about is we you looked at this. So this was how often was a certain dwell time seen. So on the right, let me show you this real quick. So if I go in, I don't know if this is anything interesting or not. Oh, hey, look, it's the same one. That's convenient. This view over here, view one, view two, changes this screen, this graph. View one is a time analysis. So how often was each time interval seen? How often did we see each time interval? When I go to view two, this is session size analysis. So out of my 20,054 connections, it looks like 20,053 of them were 52 bytes in size. That's my heartbeat. Do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. Do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. Do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. So it's basically acting like a three-year-old, right? Out here, I have one connection that transferred 104 bytes. So if this is a C2 session, this is one instance of the C2 channel was activated. So again, boss comes to me and says, hey, did they get the customer database? If this is the data we have in front of us, we get to tell them no. No, in fact, it looks like they maybe did one connection check, right? Because just to say, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. That's 52 bytes. The one outlier point added exactly is 104 bytes in size. So that's only 52 bytes more. Well, that's not much, right? That's not enough to fit, you know, an Excel spreadsheet and, you know, you're not going to fit that in 52 bytes. That's not even enough to get a directory listing. So 
we can be pretty certain. Yeah, no, they didn't get any valuable data off of here. They haven't tried to move laterally. They haven't done any of that stuff yet. Get them out now, and we're going to be in really good shape. And in fact, if we have customer data, and we're required to disclose when that customer data gets compromised, we don't have to disclose because we have proof that they didn't get to the customer database yet. We got them out before that actually happened. That's kind of cool. What if it was split up and sent out though? Well, it's only what we saw. There was only one session that was 52, uh, that was 104 bytes in size. So there's only one session. So we know it wasn't split up. But let's say there was five sessions, right? <clears throat> Think about this from like a file transfer perspective. Why would you do that? Why would the attacker go to the time, trouble, and overhead of breaking the file up into five different components in order to go in and do that transfer? That doesn't make a whole lot of logical sense. Yeah, size analysis, we talked about that. Oh, there's some other interesting things here. Like, there's a smaller size. Here's our heartbeat, but there's a smaller size here. Well, it's 40 bytes in size. My IP header, 20 bytes. My TCP header without any options, 20 bytes. 20 plus 20, 40. So these are a number of times that it tried to connect to the TC2 server, and the C2 server just ignored it. So that tells me the C2 server is pretty busy. They're, they're having a lot of luck compromising systems because the compromised systems calling home aren't always actually getting through. So the target investigation, we talked about that. So we talked about how, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, this is going to give me some geo, geo information. This is not super accurate, right? It's not going to like tell you what house on what street was this coming from. But the general category stuff, you know, oh, hey, it's coming from Beijing, China. That stuff is usually fairly accurate. That may help you kind of run this down. You know, if you're a school system and you're seeing connections coming in from China, be afraid because you're a school system. You would expect every all your connections coming in to be local you know, or at least within your state. Now, it, you know, if you see some, you know, let's say you live in Massachusetts and you see connections coming from New Hampshire. Well, they may not actually be coming from New Hampshire. Those states share a border. So it could be someone who lives just barely over the line into Massachusetts, but you know their cable provider routes them up through New Hampshire for some reason. You know That can happen. But it's not going to say Beijing, China, if you're, you know, in the, oh, well, it could be Massachusetts. No, 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 that's not how that works. So think of it as like, you know, a wider target than just a single point. Beacon web analysis. So this is kind of cool. So one of the things you may notice is that all the information may not always get displayed. You'll get three dots at the end like this. What that tells you is the information wouldn't fit in the default field size that we have here. But if you mouse over it, we'll show it to you. So for example, we can see here one IP address and we see the start of a second one and then dot, dot, dot. Well, if I put my mouse over that, it'll print out a lot more of the IP addresses. I think up to like 12 or something like that. And after 12, it will tell you, hey, there's more that we can't show on the screen. Hey, this is from China. Let's click it. Yeah, do that. Why not? Long connections. We talked about that. Oh, one sec, please. Sorry, throat's giving me trouble again. So we talked about the long connection screen. There's two different views for that as well. View one, the default, is cumulative communication time. So this might be one session. This might be 20 sessions combined together. But those 20 sessions would all have the same source IP destination IP. If I go to view two, I can look at unique individual sessions. So if there was 20 connections, I will see the 20 different connections. But the default view we give you is cumulative time, because quite honestly, at least to me, that's the one that's most important. 
Threat Intel. Yeah, so let's talk about Threat Intel a little bit. So Threat Intel is a bit of an albatross. Um, I know a lot of folks like to make a big deal about, oh, Threat Intel, and blah, 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 and yeah, whatever. Um, you have a skill that isn't as useful anymore. I'm sorry to tell you that, but it's the truth. Threat Intel was awesome when our threat vector was uh, miscreant living in mommy and daddy's basement trying to compromise more systems than their friends who play the same online game. When that was our threat model, threat intel made a lot of sense. Because they attack me, they may eventually turn around and attack you too, right? And then attack somebody else. So, hey, let's get that IP address so that fully qualified domain name identified someplace so that the later folks know, hey, anything coming from there must be bad. That worked out awesome 20 years ago because that was our threat model. And oh, by the way, IPs were fairly fixed. And then we introduced cloud, where anyone can spin up an IP address at any given time and then immediately dismiss it and move off to another IP with a couple of mouse clicks. And criminal organizations started getting involved who have money and funding and backing for things like unique malware for every target they go after, unique infrastructure to manage those attacks. And then nation states. Are, you know, obviously have financial backing and have the same thing. So today, our threat model is, <clears throat> excuse me, the malware used against me probably isn't going to be the same malware used against you. The IP addresses used against me are probably not going to be the same IP addresses used against you. We're going to change them up. So with that in mind, how useful is threat intel? Not very, right? Not very at all. In fact, most threat intel lists generate far, far more false positives than actual useful information. Depending upon what list you're looking at, the best case I've seen have been out of government-managed lists, and they have a false positive rate of 30%. Most of the public-facing ones, it's well over 90%. Because again, attackers are moving around. It's not that hard anymore. They're changing things up when they target different environments. So threat intel is not very useful at all today. Now, with that said, some people still want to use it. They haven't quite figured it out yet. So what we did with AC Hunter is we tried to come up with a way to let you feed in your threat intel list, but get rid of a lot of that noise volume. So this is how it works. <clears throat> this is more with the enterprise version. We have control over the scoring system in the community edition where you don't. But one of the things you can do with the enterprise version is you can go in and say, hey, when I get a threat intel match, assign five points to it, and that's it. But I want to get alerts when there's a 10-point change or more. Well, that means that if the only thing interesting about the session is it matched a threat intel feed, you're not going to get an alert. You won't be told this is something to pay attention to. Something else has to happen before that will occur. When we see a threat against a match against threat intel, we start monitoring how many bytes of data is leaving your system going to that system out on the internet. Because if it's a false positive, it's not going to be much data. So let's think about our, our common false positive, right? That IP address in Amazon EC2 was hostile six months ago, and today it's some mom and pop pizza site that has their menu on it or something like that. You know, it's something benign. It's not actually evil anymore. How do you tell it's not evil within the system? Well, if it's evil, they're going to start exfiltrating data. It's going to create that C2 channel. I'm going to start seeing data leaving that internal system. But if it's mom and pop's pizza shop, what data do we send them? Let's take worst case, HTTPS. We're going to send an SSL client hello. Okay, that's a couple kilobytes. That's not much. We're going to send our user agent string. We're going to send URIs for any data we want to request. All very small in the kilobyte range data transfers. So what we do with AC Hunter is we say, if the client transfer is five megabytes or less, assign the default number of thread intel points and that's it. 
If it exceeds five megabytes, start adding in additional points. If it gets to 25 megabytes, add in 100 points. So now when you get your typical 90% plus false positive and it's just mom and pop's pizza site, you don't get an alert off of that. But on the rare off occasion, you actually get a legitimate hit and more data starts getting transferred. Oh, we're throwing in points really quickly. That jumps to the top of your list is something you need to go in and pay attention to. There's also a cyber deception module built in. Um, not going to go into this too deeply because we're running just a little bit behind here, but I'll get us caught up. Um, threat Intel is basically little trip wires you can set around your environment. So the concept is you can go in and you can say, I want to create a token, which is a user named John Doe, who is an administrator. And John Doe isn't actually a real user. And what we'll do is we'll output a PowerShell script that you then go run in your domain controller that will create this user, John Doe, that will assign a randomized 32-character password, so nobody's cracking that in this lifetime, and then turn on full monitoring for that account. And you'll get a heads up anytime somebody tries to log in as that user. So if you look at your typical red team uh, adversary, what do they do once they get in? One of the first things they usually do is start doing some discovery of the environment and trying to move laterally right? What's one of the ways to do that? Well, I can enumerate all the user accounts because for some weird reason, Windows still lets you lets anybody do that. And now that I have everybody's user account, I can start trying to log into those accounts using some default passwords, right? So I might try summer 2023 because I know you're a PCI environment, which means you're supposed to change your password four times a year. And users have figured out an easy way to do those password changes in a way that they can still keep track of it. So they just add the season and the year together. Bang, that's their password. It's more than eight characters. It seems to take it. It must be fine. <clears throat> so they will try summer 2023 against every one of your user accounts. And then they'll try spring 2023 against all your user accounts. And the idea is to go low and slow enough that you're never triggering a lockout on any of the additional additional accounts. Well, as soon as they hit the John Doe account, bang, you get an alert telling you this is something you need to pay attention to. You do it with files too. One of my favorites is do this on your net login share. Create something that looks like a login script, but it's not. So now the only thing that ever touches it is your backup system, in which case you can just safe list that, no problem. But any user just doing a regular login, they're not poking around on the net login share. Folks poking around on the net login share are the ones that want to figure out where the resources are in your environment without actually having to do some type of port scan. Because the net login share is great for that. Everybody's logging and what servers they're connecting to are there and a description of the server. And yeah, it's a great way to get a lay of the land very quickly without generating any packets that might get detected. Well, Create a juicy looking login script that nobody uses. Now you get an alert when somebody tries to access that. There's also a deep dive module. So deep dive allows you to see everything this IP address was doing with systems on the other side of the firewall. So if you're looking at an internal system like this, seeing everybody it's talking to it out on the internet. It color codes things. So anything that looks a little suspicious will code in orange. Anything that looks okay, that gets coded in white. Anytime you click on a session, it's going to go through and give you a summary of the information that took place. You can even expand out the uh, the graph to identify, you know, what how many connections were taking place each hour. If I go in and click the little pivot icon here, that'll let me flip and focus in on that external IP address. So imagine this was an internal system, and I'm pretty sure it's compromised, and I'm looking at its connection taking place with the external IP address. I could pivot to that external IP, and when I do, that will focus in on that external IP, and now I get to see um, who's talking to that external IP. So if they've compromised more than one internal system, they're all going to be calling out to the same C2 server. I can go in and I can see that. Oh, well, wait, Chris, what if they set up a second C2 server and use that instead? Yeah, theoretically, that's possible. I've, I've seen one red team do that. I haven't seen that in the wild. Doesn't mean it couldn't have happened. It just means I wasn't involved if it did. But I have found this to be a very effective way when I've been on threat hunts 
of once we identify one compromise system, finding all of those slow burn ones that only call home every six to eight hours. Just pivot, look at everybody talking to that server. Anybody talking to that C2 server, they're now all in scope. Install process is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a couple of different ways you can get this. You can download it uh, the community edition. You can download it as a VM. I like the install just because it gives me a little bit more control and it lets me install things that quite honestly aren't on the VM. So if I want to run Beaker, the Beaker isn't on the VM that we distribute. But if I run the install script, I can say, yes, I want to install Beaker. And here's the IP address I want to put Beaker at. And it'll take Tira doing the full install for you. Same thing with Zeek. Community versus enterprise. I saw this got posted into Discord as well. There are some limitations with the community edition versus the enterprise. That kind of, you know, that's kind of how this stuff works, right? Still have developers, still need to get them paid. And let's take a break. So it is now the top of the hour. This is our 20 minute break. When we uh, come back, we're going to talk about data mash real quick. And then we're going to go into a hands on walkthrough of AC Hunter Community Edition. And then we'll immediately start getting into doing some laps. So if you don't have your VM up and running yet, during this break would be a great time to do that. I will see you at 20 minutes past the top of the hour. And we are back. So um, I'm going to derail the conversation for a moment and take us off thread hunting because I saw a couple of comments go by about how could people fall for social engineering attacks <clears throat> and i kind of feel the need to go through and address that so people fall for social engineering attacks because so this is personal feeling here um we're not handling it the right way we're not addressing the root cause of the problem right when you look at like what do we do to try to deal with people clicking things that they shouldn't have we have things like this is my security leadership class so you're going to get a couple of slides out of that because i am on my soapbox right now um we we try to do you know user training once a year and you know maybe we do a couple of you know red team tests to see if people fall for phishing we we don't and we think it's an education thing it's a software thing and it's not when you look at the root cause of what's going on here, why do people keep falling for this stuff? Why do they make the same uh, choices over and over again, even though they're, they're wrong? It comes down to what motivates us. It comes down to dopamine. Dopamine is responsible for so much of what goes on in our lives that we don't even realize. Dopamine is a brain chemical, right? It's referred to as one of the feel-good drugs, and it's not. It's a motivator. You would literally cease to exist without dopamine, right? When you need to eat and you're hungry, dopamine is what drives you to resolve that problem. So you would literally just sit in a lump and starve to death without dopamine in your life. This goes back to, you know, 50,000 plus years ago. You're on the Serengeti. You're hungry. You see a tree with fruit off in the distance. Dopamine is what hits you to motivate you to go to that tree. You get partway there, you get another dopamine hit to go get that tree. And, oh, hey, I can see there's a lot of fruit on it. This will not only feed me, this will feed my whole tribe. <clears throat> dopamine is what drives you to get it. When you get there, one of the feel-good chemicals kicks in and neutralizes the dopamine and gives you that feel-good feeling, hey, I got the fruit. My, me and my tribe are going to survive for another, another day. People are going to be able to eat. Right? That's how this whole system works. The problem is, you know, so we, we need dopamine. We wouldn't survive without it. The downside of it is, though, is that we've kind of short circuited that. And a lot of marketing and a lot of techniques are designed to leverage it against ourselves. You know, gambling casinos, they, they are specifically geared as much as possible to keep triggering your dopamine. So that you don't stop pulling that slot, even though you're losing money left and right. <clears throat> it's an addiction thing. So one of the problems with dopamine is it is highly addictive. And when you start getting into things like checking email, you know what happens with email? You hear your phone ding. 
Well, that triggers dopamine. Hey, that might be my boss telling me I did a good job. That might be HR telling me I'm getting a raise. That might be something really awesome. And then you go in and you check the email and it's not, it's spam, right? (laughs) Or it's some common thing. But then you see there's another email in there. Oh, well, that kicks another dopamine. So notice what happened. You check the first message. You didn't get anything to neutralize the dopamine, but then you got a second dopamine hit. And then you get a third. Then you get a fourth. So triggering, checking that mail is what's triggering that dopamine. So now a phishing message comes in, and it's not really something you are interested in, but your dopamine's high, so you're, you're, you're chemically wired to execute and try and resolve it. So you fall for it. And we don't address this chemical dependency as part of the problem. That's why people keep falling for this. We need better programs to be able to deal with it. So how do you deal with it? Just real quick, the things, those two feel-good chemicals, serotonin and oxytocin, I got a quick little description of each and what triggers them on the slide here. We need a way to trigger those to neutralize people so that they stop clicking through emails. In other words, one of the challenges we run into is how do we usually deal with addiction? If somebody drinks too much, what's step one in the recovery process? Don't do that, right? Somebody gambles too much, what's step one in the recovery process? Don't do that. If somebody's clicking into email as part of their job, you can't tell them don't do that. That's not an option. So we've got an addiction that we can't handle in a way that we normally do. The best way to go through and deal with that is to, quite honestly, leverage the fact that you know they're an addict and move the goalpost someplace else. In other words, you want to make the triggering of serotonin and oxytocin to be figuring out it's phishing versus just actually opening up the email. And there are some techniques you can work around that. I cover that as part of this class. But you know, I saw a note about how do people keep falling for this? Because we're failing them. We are feeling them because we have it stuck in our heads that if we do an annual awareness training, right, and tell people, no, that's bad, that this will fix it. Well, we're way too far into this to be able to argue that people who click on email links didn't know any better. They didn't have proper training, right? We've been talking about this for years. Anybody who has has a job knows I shouldn't click things that, that are suspicious. Everybody knows that, but we keep doing it. So it's not a training thing. It's not a technology thing. This is an addiction thing. And unless we, as the security team, help address that and move that goalpost someplace else, yeah, you're going to keep seeing this as a problem. All right, I will get off my, I will get off my uh, soapbox now. So you can't blame the people. You got to blame us. We're not training them properly. We're not handling the problem, problem correctly more on us than it is on them. But with that said, hey, data mash. <laughs> so data mash is an awesome tool. Data mash goes through, and uh, this is a statistical analysis tool. So at its root, what data mash is designed for is you can give it a bunch of numbers, and it'll tell you the min, the max, uh, the standard deviation, stuff like that. And that can be helpful if you're doing like a beacon analysis or something like that, and you got some raw numbers you want to work with. But what I really like data mash for is its ability to go through and add things together. So let me give you an example. So I'm here, I'm catting con.log. I'm using zcut to pull out the source IP, the destination IP address, and the duration. And then I'm saying sort dash K3. What does that mean? Dash K3 means normally sort would start sorting on the very first character. Dash K3 means go sort on the third column. This is our duration field. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to sort based on the longest durations. Dash RN says, use the, look at this as a number, not an alphanumeric character sequence. And N and R means do it backwards, reverse, highest to lowest. So our goal here is to look at our longest, our top five longest duration connections. Well, notice lines two and three. They're the same source and destination IP address. Look at one. And four, those are the same IP addresses. So yeah, this is the longest individual connection time, but it's not the longest two systems have been talking to each other. We need to look at that from a cumulative perspective. In other words, we need to figure out a way to add these numbers together. 
That's what Data Mash excels at. <laughs> so with Data Mash, I can go in. First, I got to clean the data up a little bit. Data Mash only wants to work with numerical values. So if I give it something different, it's going to puke on that, and it's not going to know what to do with it. See this grep command? This grep command says, anytime you see a blank line, remove it. Because again, if Data Mash sees a blank line, there's no number there for it to work with. It just exits and, and, and creates an error and it exits. So we're getting rid of the blank line so that won't happen. This duration sometimes can just be a dash character. If the two, if one system tried to connect to the other and the connection never completed, well, there was a connection there, but there was no duration because it never actually got into an established state. So Zeke describes that by putting a dash character, not a zero, because a zero would mean the com connection completed and then nothing happened. It's just saying, no, dash, it, it tried and it failed. Well, again, that dash file uh, value is not a numeric value. So if data mash sees that, again, it's going to exit on it and it's going to it's going to error on it and it's going to exit out. So saying grep dash V, anytime you see a dash, get rid of that. And we don't care about those entry because there's any entries anyway, because there's no duration to it. Then I'm taking that data and I'm running it through data mash. Dash G one comma two means when the value in common one, column one and the value in column two are the same, sum three, add up three. So I removed the blank lines, I removed the dashes, I sorted it. So that means source and destination IP, when they were the same, there'll be one line after another. And now I'm telling data mash, as long as one line, uh, the value in one and the value in two are the same, add all of those values in column three together, and then only print out a single line. And then I'm just going in and sorting it on the third column again. And now I get something like this. So rather than seeing two individual sessions and in their session time, it's adding them up and putting them together. So Data Mash is a great way to go through and do some simple math on the command line when we need to go through and do that. Data Mash is cool. I haven't seen that one. <clears throat> yeah, it is an awesome tool. It's kind of like the old R tools, uh, but I find it a little bit flex more flexible and easier to use. Now, if you want to do, uh, create a threat hunting program, one of the things you're going to need to do is test your tools, right? Like, hey, some vendor has something for $100,000 they want to send you. Does it work? Well, do a proof of concept. And now you need to simulate some beacons and some C2 connections and see how well does this tool do at actually catching that. How do you do that, right? You know, do I need to hire red teamers and use Cobalt Strike? And you can go that route. But there's some simple scripting you can do to do this as well. For example, one of the tools that we, uh, open source tools we supply, thank you, Bill, is this one here called Beacon Simulator. Beacon Simulator allows you to very easily identify a target IP. Now, this should be an IP address you control that has a listening service that you're targeting. So here we're targeting port 80. So I'd want my target IP address to have a web server running. That's the only other thing I need with you on this script. And it should be out on the internet someplace. So I can spin up something in Amazon EC2, set up a web server, and now target that. And then I can go in and I can define how often do I want to do that connection out? How much do I want to jitter it by? And this even gives you the ability to jitter the payload size if you want to do that. That's kind of cool. Because bad guys and red teamers aren't doing that yet. They probably will eventually. So if you're building this from the ground up, you probably want to make sure you're using tools that can actually catch that stuff when it occurs. So now, you know, expensive vendor gives us a tool to go in and do our proof of concept. We run this. Their tool doesn't flag it. Oh, that's a problem, right? Because now we can't rely on that thing to go in and do beacon checks. That's not too cool. Um, this is using TCP. I could do these with UDP if I wanted to go through and do that instead. I can vary the timing up if I want to play with that. It's a great way to go in and very easily create different types of beacons. Now, if I want to do a specific payload, I can do that with scripting as well. So this is just a very simple script called beacon test. And this basically says run curl, set the user agent spring, string to be modzilla version 0. 0.0001 
running it on an Atari 7800. Because, hey, we all remember the Mozilla web browser cartridge you could plug into the Atari 7800 to browse the web. No, wait, that wasn't a thing. No, <laughs> Atari 7800 was long before people were connecting to the internet. So this can't possibly exist. I like using this just because I that way I always know it's me, right? Anytime I see Atari 7800 in the user string, I know, okay, yeah, that was one of the tests I was running. Okay, fine. So, you know, you go ahead and pick something else. You know, Atari 48800 or a Nintendo or whatever it is you want to go throw and use. But notice dollar sign one. So now when someone runs beacon test space, an IP address, a fully qualified domain name, it's going to try to connect to port 80 on that system using curl, using this as a user agent string. Once it does that connection, it's going to close the connection, and then it's going to go to this line. This line says sleep for a random period of time between 200 and 350. Notice I'm using shuff instead of random. I, my personal testing, I have found shuff to be more random than random. Go figure. It's kind of like less is more than more on the, on the Windows side, whatever. But this is going to pick a random value between 200 and 250. It's only going to pick one value. And that is going to be the sleep time in seconds before it goes back and runs the curl command again. So if this picks 230, it'll pause for 230 seconds, then run curl. If the next number it picks is 301, it'll pause 301 seconds, then run curl. And it'll just keep running this over and over again until I hit you know, control C or kill it or whatever the case may be. So if I want to do beacon testing, but I want to stick things into the payload as part of that, this is one way I could go through and do that. And never underestimate the power of writing your own scripts. I have a script I wrote that I included on the VM for you called FQ. And this is a really simple script. So if I type which FQ, that'll remind me where I put it. Oh, maybe I didn't give you this script. Ooh, I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't give you the script. That must be another class I'm teaching. I apologize. But we can at least talk about what's in that script, and then you could go through and recreate this yourself if you wanted to. So running the FQ command, you feed it an IP address or a fully qualified domain name. It then goes through the DNS log files, checks the, the queries and the answers to see, did that IP address or fully qualified domain name show up? <clears throat> and if it does, it prints that information out. Then it goes in and checks HTTP log. Then it goes in and checks SSL log and looks for similar information. So what is this doing for me? Well, let's say I see a connection going to an IP address. And I'm working with the raw Zeek logs, and I want to learn more about that. I could say FQ space, that IP address. Well, DNS info comes back and tells me, oh, somebody was looking up fw.adsafeprotect.com, and that returned anycast.fq. You know, adsafeprotect.com along with that IP address. So now I know this is what the user was trying to get to when they went to that IP. Nobody connected to that IP address via HTTP. They did connect to it via HTTPS using TLS. And when they connected to it, the digital certificate checked out as valid. That's kind of good information to know, right? Can I trust this connection? Well, it depends on I trust this organization as part of it. But the other part of it is, was this a, di a valid digital certificate or a bogus one? Well, I can use the Linux subsystem to go through and check those certificates to see if they're valid. And that's what Zeke does. So I can go in and check that out. That's kind of neat. All right. So let's start jumping in and walking through this. So what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of give you a quick walkthrough of AC Hunter and what's there and, and you know what are the different features and that type of thing. So we're going to go through a data set together to go through and kind of look at these. And then once we do, I'm going to go through and I'm going to give you a lab. And you're going to take that lab and you're going to take what you've learned to go through and try and solve the problems I give you after that. So basically, I'm going to kind of handhold you through it first, and then we'll go through and we'll uh, create some data to go through and kind of hit it after that. So login information is on slide 108. So if you need to authenticate to get into your VM, this is the way to go through and do it. 
If you have any problems, I gave some troubleshooting information back in the beginning of the slide deck. And the labs directory is where everything's going to be located. That's where you'll see lab one, two, and three. Those are the labs we'll be working with in this class. And you'll see a bunch of dot log files. Those are the Zeek logs that were created from traffic that was passing by on the network. <clears throat> when you authenticate in, how to do that depends upon how you're connecting in. So if I'm in the VM and I'm running the browser in the VM, this is what I'll connect to, 127.001. Hit enter, and it'll automatically jump to auth login, and I'll get the login screen. If I'm running VirtualBox, and I want to run the browser on my host system, this is what I connect to, 127.001, colon, 10443. Or if you defined a different port for HTTPS, getting port forwarded, identify that other port instead. Hit enter, and again, you should end up at this login banner. If you're using VMware, this is the IP address. Now, we said this might get moved. It might be .129 or .130. Instead, I gave you a command to figure out the IP. But if I'm on the host system and I want to use the host system's browser, that's what I go through and point. Once I do that, again, I should get the login screen. Login is threat at activecountermeasures.com. Password is hunting2. Once you do that, that should get you into the main screen, or it may get you into pick a database. And if it tells you pick a database, pick this one here, DNSCAT2-JA3. Once you select that and then click confirm, then you'll end up at the main dashboard that you have here. One last thing, and then I'll jump in and actually start working with the browser. If you're working in the VM, you may see something like this. In other words, notice that the screen is all kind of mushed together. That's because you've got a small display. So a couple of ways to fix this. One is go into your virtual machine software and tell it to run this full screen. The other thing you can do is within the Chrome browser on the VM, go under settings and zoom out a little bit, and that'll clean it up. So you want to see this. If you're seeing something closer to this, do these steps until you get to this. Once you do that, you should be in pretty good shape. All right, so let's start walking you through this. So the first thing is loading up databases, right? So I clicked on the, so let me back up. So on the main dashboard, I can always get back here by clicking this little dashboard icon in the bottom left. If I go to the gear icon, my first option is database management. This is where I can go in and load up different databases. So if I just pick a different database, it's going to go in and it's going to load that other database up instead. So I can jump around between them that way. So if I import data, I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. But once you import data, then I have to go in and do a database select for all that database. So for example, one of the things we'll do at the tail end of this walkthrough is we're going to use the Zeek logs in the lab one directory to create a data set called lab one. So the first thing we'll want to do is go out uh, in AC Hunter is go to settings, database, look for lab one in this list, select it, and now we'll be able to go in and work with that lab one data. <clears throat> Safe lists are, well, I'm not going to nuke these. I'll do that in a second. Safe lists are, these are safe lists that have been added to the system. So if I save you edit, this is all the safe list entries that have been created so far. You should not have these. You all should be empty. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to notice it's telling me F5. I'm going to say I want to delete them all. I could also export them, import them. So if I want to do a backup on them, I can do that. But I'm just going to delete all these safe list entries for now. So notice now the button's grayed out. There's nothing to view because there's no safe list entries yet. Themes is just pretty straightforward. There's a couple of different modes you can play around between. And about is just going to tell you where support help is and stuff like that. But to start, we want to go to database, DNS cat, JA3. So if I click confirm on that, <clears throat> that's going to go through and that's going to load up that database. Now, one sec. 
Now, I have a couple of options for accessing data. <clears throat> Here's my list of all my internal systems. On the right-hand side, it's telling me <clears throat> what caused that score. You know, where do these points come from? So anytime I click something on the left, the information on the right changes. If I go in and I go to beacon score, right? So let's say I select the first one and then I select beacon score up here. Notice it automatically filters and shows me only beacons associated with the source IP address. So if I want to drill in on a particular system, that'd be the easiest way to do that. If I use the icons on the bottom, this is going to give me generic data. So if I go in and select that, notice now it's showing me all the IPs, and by default, they're getting sorted by score. I could go in and say, no, I want to look at them based on connection account, and it'll reorganize them that way. So if I have other parameters that, you know, I'm, some folks, rather than using the score, want to look at the raw number of times it connected and use that first. Hey, that's fine. You can just go up and select. If you want to look at it the other way, you can go through and do that. Notice we color code things. Anytime we've color coded it in green, that's a way of saying, yeah, this is probably not something you need to worry about. If it shows up in red, yeah, that's something that's worth going in and paying attention to from there. So that allows you to go through and kind of walk through <coughs> uh, different settings. Now, over here on the right, this is telling me data that the system knows about this external IP. So this was the IP we were talking to. The user looked up alphastjameschurch.org. That's what brought them to this IP address. So now my first question should be, who is the stjameschurch.org? And is there a business need associated with that? Because if they're not, this is going to start looking suspicious very quickly. It's in DigitalOcean. Does that make sense? So I can go through and I can kind of dig through things that way. If I go to the next one, uh, actually, let's go to Beacon's Web. Yeah. I go into be, be, so beacons are based on the IP address information. Beacons web is based on the fully qualified domain name that it's talking to. So let's go to the second entry here. So I'm, I click the beacons web icon and then I clicked the second one on this list 1055, 182, 100. So what this is telling me is that the um, SNI information, the host data that was embedded inside of the protocol said that the user was trying to get to config.edge.skype.com. As part of that, they were talking to this one IP address. Here's the information on the digital certificate. So it's CN matches what the user was trying to get to. And is this an invalid digital certificate? The answer is no. So now I can be pretty certain this is Skype. It's not somebody trying to pretend to be Skype with a bogus signature or, or um, digital certificate or something along those lines. And by the way, if you forget what data set you're in, if you look over here on the right, this will always tell you what database you have loaded up in that very first line. <laughs> now, notice. This is a beacon. It's going off once or twice every hour, all day long. <clears throat> but it's going to config.edge.skype.com. Let's say Skype is a legitimate business app. It's okay for people to be using that within our environment. I don't want to ever see this again. See this little filter icon? I can click that and follow along with me here. You do it too. Click on the little filter icon, <clears throat> and this brings up my safe list entries. So I could do it based on the source IP, the destination IP, but the best way to do it is based on the fully qualified domain name. Why? Because if this goes through a CDN, it'll still work. If they move this to another system, it'll still work. So anytime you can create a safe list entry based on fully qualified domain name instead of IP, you definitely want to do it based on fully qualified domain name instead. Never, ever safe list the IP addresses of content delivery networks. Never do that because it could be anything passing through them to the other side. Always use fully qualified domain names. Now, I could create an entry for config.edge.skype.com, but one of my options is to do a wildcard match. What's the wildcard do? Well, my experience has been 
config.edge.skype.com is probably not the only host Skype is going to be talking to. There might be a server.edge.skype.com or a patch.edge.skype.com or something along those lines. So what wildcards allow me to do is to match on multiple system types. So when this little slidey bar is here, this says only match when it's config.skype uh, config.edge.skype.com. This says any subdomain attached to edge.skype.com is okay. If I go in and create it this way, I may be able to get away with one safe list instead of five or eight or however many hosts happen to be a part of that. I personally don't feel comfortable doing that, safe listing the entire domain. Why? Because if something bad happens in that domain, this could go bad really quickly. Environments tend to watch their public-facing servers most closely. My guess is anything under edge.skype.com is recognized to be customer-facing servers, so they're going to watch them the closest. So I'm okay making a wild card here, but I probably wouldn't want to do it for all of Skype.com. Now, this might get a little problematic when you get into like Microsoft, because there might be multiple subdomains under Microsoft.com. So it would be faster to safe list all of Microsoft.com, but I personally don't feel comfortable doing that. Now, if you feel comfortable and you want to do it, go for it. You know, I'm not going to hunt you down or anything, but I always find this to be a little bit safer. And then I can write a comment about why this is here. <clears throat> um, this is for Skype, and we use it. See, Brenton 2023, <clears throat> 10.03. Okay, great. Now we know why the safe list entry was created, who created it, when they created it. Apply safe list. And you'll see the, the screen will update. If you've got a low memory system, you might have to hit control R to get it to take that change. But once you do, <clears throat> you'll see that entry is no longer there. That's being safe listed out. Now, what's kind of cool about safe list is that, <clears throat> yeah, and if you found another entry that you're looking at and you're saying, yeah, this looks like normal network traffic, you know, like the C CDN OneNote. Yeah, go ahead and safe list that instead. That's fine. Just follow along. Not a problem. Um, now, one of the things that's cool about this is let's say, uh, are you on the Beacons tab or the Beacon Web tab? I am currently on the Beacon Web tab. You can see that's kind of a brighter white down here at the bottom. So that lets us know we're in that module right now. What's really cool about this is let's say we did this and two weeks later we figured out Oh, shoot, that isn't Skype. You know, that was Skype with a three instead of an E. Somebody created an associated domain in order to fish people or whatever. I created a safe list entry I shouldn't have. Oh, my God, how do I recover from that? Uh, can I hit F11 to full screen? We can't see the buttons on the bottom. Sure thing. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Okay, so how do I recover from this? So I created an entry for Skype. Two weeks later, I find out it's not Skype. It's something else. What do I do to recover? Here's what I do. I go back to the dashboard. I go under settings. I go under my safe list. I go to view edit. I search through the list and find the entry. And I confirm, now let's pretend, Oh, yeah, that's a three. That's not an E. I screwed up. I can go in and I can delete that. One of the cool things about the safe list is we still collect all that data. So let's say I did that two weeks ago. Well, now I could go back to my databases and every database I created over the last two weeks, just load it back up and we'll evaluate it and rescore it based on that safe list entry not being there. So because we still can collect the data, even when you safe listed, that keeps you from shooting yourself in the foot like that, <clears throat> which I kind of feel like is a good feature. Cool. Uh, let's see. Oh, I know what I wanted to talk about too. 
So I'm going to go back into Beacon's Web. And this is a CDN, uh, this is a connection to CDN OneNote.net. Right, I'm looking at my very first line, 1055, 100, 106. Yeah, this looks like a beacon. So let's see if there's a business need here. It says it's part of OneNote. OneNote's a Microsoft thing. <clears throat> Notice when I mouse over the IPs, there's a ton of them. It's going to cdn.onenote.net. Yeah, okay. That is content delivery network for OneNote.net. So that makes sense. There's a lot of different servers I'm connecting to. Is this actually OneNote? Well, the CN matches that fully qualified domain name, and the digital certificate is valid. So it appears to definitely be going to that system. If I want to look, at, look into it a little bit more, I can click on the fully qualified domain name, and I can use one of these tools to go through and research that. So for example, what does VirusTotal know about it? Well, virus totals telling me nobody's flagged this. It looks okay. This looks safe. It's been part of Akamai Edge or Edge Key for a while now. This looks okay. So I can go in and I can use these third party tools to go in and dig in a little bit deeper, which is kind of nice. Let me close that up, go back here. Now I can also do that for my IP addresses. So if I click an IP, if I click just one of the IPs, it's going to list them all out. So let's say this one I wanted to investigate for some reason, and I wanted to use Alien Vault. And just click on that, and now we'll go to Alien Vault, and we'll see what Alien Vault knows about that system. In the commercial version, uh, these are editable. In the community edition, they're not. But this is a pretty good list to be able to work with be able to go through and run through this stuff. Deep dive, we talked about that. So let's say, oh, I think this is a C2 server. Who else is talking to it? I can go into deep dive and see what IP addresses are talking to the system. So this is telling me that 20, well, that kind of looks like someone kind of hanging out, spread eagle, right? Almost doing like a yoga pose. <laughs> so this is telling me that 23.4.3 one thir uh, 13.21 out on the internet. 1055 100 110 is talking to it via TCP 443, but it only did one connection during this one hour period of time. This IP address here, same type of thing during that same hour, one connection, that was it. So notice I can go in and I can drill in. So if I thought this was a C2 server, Deep Dive is going to quickly tell me who are all my internal systems that have communicated with it over the last 24 hours. That makes life a little bit easier. So these investigation menus can be super helpful. Uh, let's see. What else is kind of useful here? Oh, let's look at long connections. So I'm going to go to the long connection module down the bottom. And now this is going to show me my longest connections. If I'm on view one, which is the default, cumulative time. If I go to view two, these are my longest individual sessions that took place. I usually work with cumulative time. I don't go back to the individual session one that often. Now, notice some of these, it's saying, yeah, I don't know what the application layer was. So think about this. We're looking at 24 hours worth of data. Zeke is using the initial handshake and the initial negotiation to identify when what that application is. Well, these were all running for 24 hours, which means the handshake probably took place before we started collecting this data. Well, that's probably why it's not actually seeing what's going on at the app level. So if I see a beacon and it doesn't recognize the application layer, I get really nervous. If I'm looking at a long connection, and that long connection has been running the entire time of the data set, I'm less likely to be worried about that. Notice once we get down to like 20 hours, we start seeing what the application layer is. We got the same type of data up here that we were looking at on the last screen. Um, excuse me. So that makes it pretty straightforward. So we're at the top of the hour. 
that's it for the data walkthrough on this. You guys should be able to kind of take it from there. But when we come back, what we're going to do is we're going to import the data from the lab one directory here. So I'm in the lab one directory. I have these files. When we come back from break, we're going to import this into AC Hunter, and then you're going to go through and do your first threat hunt. So it is the top of the hour. At 10 minutes after the top of the hour, we'll pick up from here and keep going. I'll catch you then. This is a community edition. That's the one we're using. Pizza never arrived. I hate it when that happens. Uh, is there a free demo for AC Hunter? Yeah, it's the one we're using in the um, in the VM here. That's the community edition. Uh, how does AC Hunter differ from NDR solutions like Extra? <laughs> Oh, I, the, my first thought was because we say what we do, what we say we do, but that would be a really bad thing to say. Um, so let me kind of put it this way. So we had a, we had a, uh, let's say, a little bit of NDR here, um, or NDA here. So we had a very large computer chip making company that most people have heard of before uh, come to us about two years ago and say, hey, product looks good. We need this kind of coverage. We want to kind of check out what you're doing. And they have huge pipes to the internet. I, you know, Most of their connections are in like the 100 gigabit range. And we just weren't ready to kind of keep up with that. So the way, what they went through a demo. We kind of checked out some of their network stuff with them. And we kind of mutually decided that, hey, you know, this might not be the best fit because we just were not designed to keep up with 100 gigabit yet. You know, we can get into the 30, 40 gig, but, you know, 100 gig, that's just a little bit beyond our capability right now. Maybe we'll talk again in a while. And that was two years ago. And I got a call back from them and they wanted to, you know, go through another demo. And talked to him about, you know, went in, talked to him and told him, hey, look, we've got a major rewrite coming. It's going to go through and it's going to, you know, it should be able to keep up with your environment with the changes we've made. We've got, you know, 10x performance increases for a lot of the stuff, but we're not quite there yet. And one of the C-level people that were on the call said, we don't care. We want to use your product. We've spent the last two years looking at every competitor on the market. And what we found is that none of them do what they want. <laughs> so, uh, none of them do what they claim. In fact, a lot of them failed during the POC because they would deploy the product like extra op and set up a C2 channel and it would get missed. And when they would go back to the vendor and say, hey, so you kind of failed our test, the vendor's response was always, oh, you did it wrong. Oh, well. Using Cobalt Strike to set up a command and control channel, that's not really a legitimate test. Oh, give me an F and break. <laughs> we talked about Cobalt Strike is used 95% of the time, and you're not detecting Cobalt Strike? Oh, come on. And it turned out what the problem was is they could only detect when they had a known signature. So what's the big difference between us and a lot of the products out there? It's our behavior analytics. We've got about 30 patents on the way we go through and do this. And the reason we created those patents is so that we can include them in our open source and free tools so that no one can try and close them off behind a very expensive paywall. And it's the behavior analytics that allows you to go in and find what, you know, what is brand new, you know, and what hasn't actually shown up in on GitHub or has known signatures or something like that. And it was just really telling to me that they came back and they said, you know, the fact that you couldn't keep up with our network, that was not the last worst problem we ran into over the last years. Most of them completely missed everything. Uh, that to me just kind of said a lot. So, <clears throat> all right. So let's get into doing some labs. So the first thing we need to do is we need to take these Z logs and we need to get them into AC Hunter. How are we going to do that? We're actually going to use Rita for that. What? Rita? Yeah. AC Hunter is actually powered by Rita. In fact, we ought to do a little trademark thing around that, powered by Rita. Um, <clears throat> the reason for that is we wanted to make sure that our open source tool was always just as capable as our commercial product. We didn't want to run into, 
oh, you know, AC Hunter does better at detecting beacons than Rita does because we made this change and forgot to make it in the open. So no. So by doing it this way, all the tools are always just as capable as each other. So we want to be in the lab one directory, right? If I type PWD, I'm in my home, my home directory is the threat user, labs, lab one. So I'm right here. And then this is what I'm looking at, all my Zeke logs. So I want to get those into AC Hunter. So I'm going to type Rita space import space star.log. I want to import all of these log files. And then I need to give it a name. <clears throat> Can we get a CLI on the web VM? Unfortunately, no, but these VMs, uh, these labs have always been already been imported into the web for you. So you should be able to go in and select lab one as a database and you'll be okay. So read a space, import space, start out logs. And then we get to give a name to this data set we're going to create while we're in the lab one directory. So let's just keep this simple and name this lab one. And now I'm going to hit enter. It's going to ask me for my password. So that's hunting. And then we'll see Rita do its thing. So Rita goes through and it shows me what log files is it working with? There's some useful information in here, <laughs> like unique, unique connection aggregation. One, well, that tells me there's only one internal system it processed. This is a test data set. So there's only one internal system. There's no proxy data. So there's nothing there to make it worth actually going in and analyzing. It did find 40 different connections that look like potential beacons. It did find eight different user agent strings. It did find 24 instances where it wasn't a valid certificate. So this, just seeing the import, kind of gives me an idea of what data might actually show up within, um, within the AC Hunter interface. So now I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to go back to AC Hunter, and I'm going to go up here to settings. It defaults to the database list, and look, we now have a Lab 1 data set. So I'm going to click on that. I'm going to click Confirm. And now that I do, I've got some data I can go through and check. We've only got one internal system, so we don't need to worry about whether we click up here versus down, the icons down in the bottom. It's all going to kind of lead to the same because there's only one source. This was a test data set. But we want to go through and start doing our hunt. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's see. What did I miss? Anything? talked about that, safe list entries. We talked about that. These are just slides to kind of reinforce what I showed you as part of the, um, part of the uh, hands-on walkthrough. So if I'm flipping through them quickly and you're not seeing them all, don't get panicked. This, I'm just flipping through them because we already covered all this. I'm just making sure I didn't actually miss anything. We talked about deep dive. We talked about the investigation menus. Oh, we didn't talk about this. One security vendor flagged this. Okay, so here's a problem we've run into. We have these test data sets that we're using, where what we did is, uh, usually this was Keith, would go up and, and set up this command and control channel. So he'd go through, go through grab malware, he would load it up on a system, so he'd basically affect a system and have a call out to, an, uh, to a command and control server that we control. Would capture traffic on that, and then we'd go through and we'd analyze that as part of doing the classes. So the compromise system, that was a feature. The C2 server was never a C2 server in the wild. It was one that we controlled and only used as part of these tests. And we use this to create PCAP files and uh, Zeek logs that then folks can go through and use in this, not just in this class, but in general. Right? If you want to go through and kind of vet your threat hunting skills, one of the things you can do is you can go up to our blog and go through the malware of the day postings, where we've gone through and we've grabbed some malware and we've analyzed it. And what I recommend to folks is go to the malware of the day po uh, blog post, jump to the bottom, grab the PCAP, and analyze it and see if you can't find the C2 and see what you can learn about it. Now go back and read the blog entry. Did you miss anything? If you did, there may be things you need to tweak as part of your threat hunting process. But it's always been test data. These aren't real attacks. And yet, it keeps ending up in these threat intel feeds. So these threat intel feeds will flag these as evil. And they're not. It's just test data. So I kind of talked about 
Excuse me, one sec. Sorry about that. And again, I want to apologize again for my voice. It's definitely telling me I've been talking too much for too long. So I apologize. I know it's getting worse and worse as we go through. It should get a little better from here because doing the labs, I'll shut up for a while. And that'll give it time to come back. But um, this is test data. There's no reason anybody should be flagging this as evil. And yet they do. So this kind of talks you know, back to that accuracy thing I talked about earlier. Uh, somebody had asked a question about, hey, the malware of the day, how do we get that in here? Take the malware of the day PCAP, run it through Zeek, take those Zeek logs and put them in the exact same way you see us doing here. And you can go through and you can use AC Hunter for that. You're good, Chris. Speedy recovery. Thank you so much, folks. I really appreciate it. I really do. Appreciate you putting up with my breaking up voice. So, yeah, we talked about long connections. Um, yeah, okay. And now this is starting to get caught up here. So we did this lab import. We went in and did the Rita import star.log lab one. We talked about the output and what that means. And then we noticed that that now shows up as a selectable database. We selected confirm, and then we ended up on the home screen. So here's what I want you to do. Go to the Beacons web module to start. I always like to start with Beacon web. That always has some of the most interesting stuff in it. There are going to be six entries that score 80% or above. I want you to do a quick evaluation of those. Don't spend any more than 60 seconds on any of those connection pairs. So if you spend the maximum amount of time, right, this shouldn't take you any longer than six minutes to go through and do. But I want you to go through and just do a quick skim of them and come out and say, suspicious, not suspicious. We're all six. That's it. Don't worry about digging in deeper. Don't worry about, well, I'm not sure. Do a protocol analysis. No, no, no. Just say, I'm not sure or it's okay. Those are the only two things you're looking for right now. Give this a hit. I'll be in Discord and then we'll go through and we'll cover it together in a couple of minutes. All right. Let's talk about these. So I said start with the Beacon Web module. So I'm going to go into Beacon Web, and we said I think it was the first six that we want to go through and look at. And you can see they're color coded. So my first one, two, three, four, five, six. These two are in orange. These are in red. My last one, the one we're going to skip, is in yellow, and its score is seventy percent. For beacons, I like to focus in on anything that's 80% or higher. Those are usually worth paying attention to. If I don't have anything that's 80% or higher, yeah, I'll drop a little bit below that. But when I'm first going in and looking at my network, the higher the score, the more it's worth paying attention to. So let's start with this first entry. So this first entry, I've got a connection from an internal system going to an external IP address. Oh, hey, look at that. A little more than two connections an hour, uh, um, two connections a minute are going off. I can draw a flat line here, so that's definitely a persistent connection. Looks like they're all going off at about a 27 second interval. Sometimes it's 30 seconds, so it's going off pretty repetitively. We go and look at some of the data. Now we're looking at Beacon's web. What gets printed out here is the host parameter information is part of the HTTP session. So the host parameter is supposed to be the fully qualified domain name or the server you're trying to talk to. One of the things you can do with a web server is you can run virtual servers. So the idea is I can have one physical machine, but 50 different web servers running on it, and they all have the same IP address. Well, if they all have the same IP, how does it figure out who, to who you're trying to talk to? This host parameter in the HTTP header. That's what tells the physical server, this is the virtual server you need to route this connection to. Well, that host parameter is an IP address. That's not right. The only time I ever see that take place is when something not right from a security perspective is taking place. So, for example, a lot of vulnerability scanning tools, right? When you use those to do a vulnerability scan against a web server, they'll use a host parameter that's the IP address. Because they're not really trying to connect and access data. They're trying to test to see, is that system vulnerable to anything? 
So they're not actually worried about talking to any specific virtual web server. So that's highly suspicious for me. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, hey, look at the user agent string. Mozilla 4 running on Windows 7. Hmm, that's kind of old. Is that, you know, that may be something I might want to dig into a little bit more later. So this first one, oh, that's highly suspicious. 3,000 connections over 24 hours. Yeah. So I'm going to, so remember, we need to make two lists. One is these are suspect IP addresses. And then here are the ones that my initial thought is we can probably just safe list. So this one definitely goes on the suspect list. All right, let's go to our second one. Still a pretty high beacon score. This is going to array506.prod.do.dsp.mp.microsoft.com. Okay. That sounds like one of the patching servers being used over at Microsoft. Going to one IP address. Now, this is kind of interesting. Invalid certificate. Yes. What does that mean? That's Zeke's way of telling us I couldn't validate this digital certificate. Now, normally, that would be something to be concerned about. But Microsoft is a little different. Here's what Microsoft's doing. As we all know, digital certificates are expensive, right? If I go to a certificate authority and I say, <clears throat> uh, well, yes, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, contact us, or if you go um, under the AC Hunter section, there's a place where it says book a demo, and you can just grab a time slot out of that, whatever works for you. So normally when we see a, an invalid digital certificate, that's something to worry about. Well, like I said, this is Microsoft, and Microsoft has to be different. <laughs> so as we all know, digital certificates, they're kind of expensive, right? To get a digital certificate for your server, for my uh, trusted third party, it's usually going to run you a couple hundred bucks. Well, as we know, Microsoft is a 501c. They're a nonprofit. They have very little money to work with. So having to spend $200 on a digital certificate for their servers, that would you know completely just put them out of business. So they said, wow, we can't afford $200 a server for a digital certificate. I know what we can do. We own the operating system, right? These systems are going to be calling back for patches for the operating system that we maintain. So let's do this. Let's sign our own digital certificates and then just tell the endpoint system, yeah, you can trust this. No problem. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. And now when that system calls in to check for patches and sees, oh, this is a weird digital certificate. Who was this signed by? There's an registry key entry in there that says, oh, well, that's trustworthy. Don't worry about that. And, and, you know, and we're fine and everything's good. And that saves Microsoft the you know, $200 per server that allows them to stay in business even for today. So like I said, Microsoft kind of a spec. Now, I kid about that, of course. You know, Could they have paid the 200 bucks? Oh, I would think so. But they didn't bother. They're generating their own self-signed certs. And they're doing it simply because they're saying, hey, we own everything. We're Microsoft. Oh, give me a friggin' break. So here's why this is failing. Zeek is running on Linux. The Linux store of trusted third parties is only the trusted third party certificate authorities. It doesn't include this one that Microsoft created in their back row. So when Zeek goes to validate this certificate, Zeek says, I don't recognize this as a valid certificate authority. Yes, this is an invalid certificate. Now, can you fix this? Yes, you can. If you take the digital certificate from the signing server on Microsoft, and I gave you a link for it and how to do this in the slides, and import that into Linux, you will now validate these digital certificates. And that'll work just fine for you. So for the folks of you that said, hey, this said it's an invalid cert. This makes this suspicious. Good catch. Absolutely. That's the way I want you thinking. But this is an edge case. And in this case here, we can look at that for now and say, yeah, they probably shouldn't have done it that way, but it is actually okay. All right. Let's look at the next one. Lservice.weather.microsoft.com. And it's an HTTP session. 
Okay. It's talking to many, many, many different IP addresses. So we could go in and we could kind of start digging through these to see, are these associated with Microsoft or not? Or maybe Akamai, who's one of their upstreams. You know, notice we see some weather associations here. Um, it looks like it went to Morgan Stanley for a while. I'm not sure why that happened. Hmm, that's kind of weird. <laughs> did, micro did Microsoft buy Morgan Stanley and nobody told me? I'm not sure. Maybe. Ugh. Thanks, guys. All right, let's close that one up. But yeah, this looks like it's just the Microsoft or the Windows desktop checking in to see, you know, is there a weather update? And it does it twice an hour, right? So there's the little weather widget to tell you, oh, no, it's going to rain or, you know, it's going to be sunny. Get out of the house. What are you doing in front of the damn computer? You know, whatever the case may be. That's what's probably going on here. And it's Microsoft's, you know, Wins agent. Yeah, that's the one it usually uses for tile services. So that one looks okay. Uh, we're back to an array with a bad certificate. We already talked about 506. But notice both of, the, uh, both of these are part of the broad subdomain. So if we get into safe listing, which we will, we'll probably want to create a star.prod safe list Excuse me. And that'll safe list both of these at the same time. The next one, ct ctldl.windowsupdate.com. Uh, okay, that sounds like Microsoft check, checking for patches. HTTP session, so there's no digital certificate to check. Again, we could do some rundowns on the IPs. This one's going to turn out to be okay, too. And then our last one, we've got another array. So there's three of them that we could do a wildcard safe list for that would clear those up. <laughs> so to recap, out of our six, first one, yeah, that looks suspicious. We had three others that looked suspicious because Microsoft signed their own digital cert, but for now, we're going to say these are actually okay. So that's where we're at at this point here. <laughs> All right, let's see if I missed anything. Oh, yeah. So with all of these labs, I'm going to give you the lab. And if you start doing the lab and you're like, Chris, I kind of know what you're saying, but I don't really know what to do first. I'm not even sure how to even get started with this. Go to the next slide. It'll be the hint slide. And normally I will not cover the hint slide because that's there so that for the folks that need just a little bit of an extra helping hand, this helps to kind of push you in the right direction. <laughs> After that, I'll have the answers. So if you go through the hints and you're still confused, go check the answers and then you can kind of work the problem backwards that way. But we went in, we talked about this stuff. So first entry, high beacon score, lots of connections, Windows user agent. We talked about that. That looks bad. No host string. It was an IP address. So yeah, we're really worried about this first one. We're going to have to do a deeper dive on it. Our second entry, and all the way down through the rest of the six, this all looked like it was Microsoft stuff. So we're probably in pretty good shape with that. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go in and create safe list entries so that our five connections, all this Microsoft stuff, doesn't get displayed anymore. Now, <clears throat> one thing I'm gonna I want to show you real quick. Remember that when you're doing this, if you've got low memory on the system, let me just pick one here, tile service. So let's say I want to safe list this. I'm thinking, yeah, this is just Windows desktop checking in to see what the weather is. I'm not worried about that. I'm going to go in. I'm going to create a safe list entry for it based on the fully qualified domain name. Hit safe list. If this does not update and disappear like you just saw here, Hit Control R on your keyboard to refresh the page. If you if you're running like right on the hairy edge and just barely having enough RAM, sometimes the screen won't update right away. So if you run into that, hit Control R and you'll be okay. Chris, if I might interrupt briefly, please do. For anybody who's using the online instances, T Hunt One through T Hunt Three, remember those are shared. And so if you safe list something, somebody else won't be able to see those entries. 
So unfortunately, I'd like to ask you not to go and add safe list entries to those three virtual machines. Good point, Bill. <clears throat> Thanks for jumping in with that. So for everybody else, create safe list entries for the other five. You just saw me do one. So there's four left. I'll give you a hint. For those last four, you only need to create two safe list entries. So go in, hit that. We'll go through and we'll cover it. Uh, one comment I wanted to kind of just hit real quick. Lucos mentioned, fifth entry uses the user agent Microsoft Crypto API 10. I read Crypto API and I thought it was suspicious. Great catch. You know, look for stuff you haven't run across before. Uh, if you did some research on that, though, you would, which we're not doing as part of this class, we don't have time in these labs, but had this been a real threat hunt, if you started doing some digging, you'd see, yeah, that is actually a legitimate user agent string that Microsoft uses. So one of the things we can always do is go in and do a little bit more digging to say, is it, you know, I think it's suspicious. Yeah, and it very well might be. It is absolutely worth your time to go in and run that down. Sometimes I'll do that even when I recognize the string because they're user agent strings. They're text sensitive. So sometimes what you'll run into is an adversary will try and create a legitimate user agent string, but they'll get a space character wrong. Oh, they'll get the version number wrong. Um, I've seen user. I've seen the user agent string Microsoft Internet Explorer. Oh no, that's bogus. <laughs> if you look that up as a user agent string, that is bogus. Microsoft Internet Explorer always identifies itself as IE space and then its version. It would never write out the words Microsoft Internet Explorer. So some of this is, you know, time on the bench. Some of this is, you know, you're going to run into something for the first time, need to do a little research. And because it took brain cells to go through and do that research, you don't want to have to do that again. You'll remember it. So the next time you run across it, you'll hit it. But also keep in mind that sometimes it's just a matter of a space character. So it's always worth kind of digging in a little bit deeper. All right, I'm going to give you some more time to work through this one. Hey, so uh, some good questions and comments in Discord. Uh, Razor Run, thank you for coming in. Uh, appreciate having you here. Thank you for the kind words. Sorry about the flu. We need some software running on us, right? Some sort of endpoint agent to protect us from these types of things. Uh, Blues, we love supporting folks that are going through and trying to teach this stuff in an academic environment. So if there's any support we can provide, that's cool. Uh, one of the things we do is we have uh, professors that will host a class while we're running this class, and they'll have their students all tune in and do the labs at the same time. Um, and one of the things we'll accommodate, and Shelby can help you out with this, is you know each student should get a copy of the certificate. But if the instructor is the only one who signed up, we don't know who they are. So we're happy to work with you know professors to make sure that kind of gets worked through. So yeah, please feel free to use the VM, use the tool, use the slides, uh, whatever you need. Want to help support that effort? <clears throat> cool. So this one should have been fairly straightforward. Oh, there was one other comment about the fifth IP address. If you go to, I think it was um, uh, Virus Total and kind of check it out, that it pops up as being uh, one of the IPs or ones that has a Trojan on it. Be careful with those. Um, a lot of these lists are kind of community efforts, which means anybody can submit anything. And when you look at the ones where they go through and they, um, oh, cool. Okay. Uh, okay, Blues, yeah, whatever works on your end is cool by us. So um, one of the things you find is that when it's a community effort, not everybody really understands network traffic and what's going on. So I've seen like, you know, Microsoft servers that are being accused of, you know, phishing, spamming, port scanning, and I don't know, dogs and cats sleeping together, whatever, all at the same time. You know, and it, and it, no, it's not. It's just a patch server. You know, it's so sometimes the data going in isn't vetted very well. Um, sometimes it's just brain dead dumb. You know, I've, I've voiced my opinion of thread intel many times. 
So I, I will just, you know, close that out again by saying, um, always look at those lists with a little bit of an eye of scrutiny. Don't take them as gospel. <laughs> we'll just kind of leave it at that. Dogs and cats sleeping together. Oh, yeah. You know, when servers do that, you know all things are going wrong. The Pillsbury Doughboy is going to grow really big and trash the city. See how many people get that movie reference. So our first one, we said, this is suspect. We're going to come back to that. So I'm going to go to my second one. And this was one of my arrays. So I'm going to go into safe list. I'm going to say I want to do it based on fully qualified domain name for all my internal hosts. I'm going to enable the wild card. And I'm going to say anything under prod is okay. And then I'm going to safe list that. And when I do notice a bunch of entries disappear because I had uh, array 509, 506, and 503. So that one safe list entry took care of all three at the same time. This one, CTLDL, Windows Update. We're going to go in. We'll do a safe list for that. I'm just going to leave it as it is. I don't want to safe list everything that's part of the windowsupdate.com domain. I just don't like to do that for any root level domain. So I'm going to safe list that. And now we're down to the one we're worried about and one that kind of fell below the radar. And if I look at that, settings dash wind dat data, Microsoft.com. Um, <clears throat> This also has an invalid certificate. Oh, thank you guys. Yeah, you really get your act together. So I could go in and safe list that if I wanted to. And now it'd be just to have the one that we know we need to jump in a little bit further. Oh, good. Look at this, folks. Yeah, they they caught that. That was from that that was from the first Ghostbusters movie. Or maybe it was the second. It was one of them where one of the characters are going off that, you know, it was going to be anarchy, dogs and cats sleeping together. And yeah, that was one of my favorite lines from that movie. Cool. Let's see if I missed anything here. So we did the arrays. That one entry got rid of a bunch. Yeah, here's what the list looks like when we're done. And our next lab. So we're going to walk away from beacons for a moment. We know we have one we need to dig in deeper. But let's go look at long connections. When I do a hunt, I always try to kind of go for the low-hanging fruit, go for the easy stuff first. In other words, if it looks like it's probably going to be okay, it shouldn't take me that long to validate whether it's okay or not. The ones that are problematic, like that first beacon we looked at, those are usually a much deeper rabbit hole we're going to go down. And it's going to take us longer to kind of figure that out. So I tend to kind of mark those as, I need to go deep on that one. Now let's see if there's anything else I can kind of clean out of the way very quickly. So here's what I want you to do. <clears throat> go under the Long Connections module. So the little module at the bottom, look for Long Connections, go in there. And I just want you to do a quick check on anything that's running for five hours or longer. And again, this is the same thing. Spend about 60 seconds and identify, I'm pretty certain this is okay. And I'm not sure about this one. I'm going to need to spend a little bit more time on it. That's all you're going to need to go through and figure out on this. So I'll give this a shot. I'll give you a couple of minutes, and then we'll go through and we'll cover it. We should be able to come back and get this done before break. Hey, so let me take one of these questions real quick, because it's something I see come up a lot with this type of training. Um, the approach hasn't been what I expected. Where we're covered, looking for beacons, etc. But I expected us to be going uh, to be going through, come up with a hypothesis on activity that might be possible, figuring out how that would manifest at points of visibility, seeing if anything appears, and verify the visibility works to establish the hypothesis, you know whether it's true or not, and then feed that into detection for automation. That's how we've done signatures for years, right? And if you think about that process, that, that's how we go about generating signatures. And we kind of said back in the beginning, what we do doesn't work. That's why we end up with three months, six months, dwell times where attackers are on our network running around because we're kind of stuck in our little box of only looking for the stuff we know we need to worry about. One of the cool things about behavior analytics is that it can help us find things we didn't know could happen, right? 
like we talked about, hey, attackers might start you know, using that process. I might never discover when someone starts jittering the payload size of their C2 sessions because I've never seen it before. I wouldn't know to create a hypothesis for that. But by going in and using behavior analytics, that will still pop up like a, uh, like a sore thumb. So threat hunting is a little different than how we used to do things in the past. We've kind of recognized that, you know, attackers are evolving. They're changing their tactics. We don't always know what to expect they're going to do next. So what we need to do is go in and look for how do we expect the traffic to behave and when do we see variations off of that? And when we see variations off of that, whether they're expected or not, that's what we need to go in and pay attention to. So yeah, the whole concept here is to kind of go through and see what's the cool stuff, right? Like, you know, and again, I keep picking on it, but Sunburst was kind of awesome for us because no one knew it was there and we didn't know it was called Sunburst. But we had folks that were flagging it with both the commercial and the open source tools. Hey, our solar wind server is calling out to an IP address it's never done before. That process that was just that was described in Discord is what tools were using to create signatures and hypotheses that never caught that tool. It wasn't until behavior analytics, which is how Fire I found it, was applied and then made publicly available that a signature was created that now that process would now work. But when you're talking about bleeding edge stuff, it tends to fall apart. So that's why we tend to go more with the behavior perspective. All right. With that said, it is the top of the hour. So I wanted to get this covered, but I wanted to make sure I answered that question. So let's take our 10 minute break. When we come back, we'll hit the answer to this real quick and we'll go on from there. So I will chat with you all in about 10 minutes. All right. So I've been beating up a lot on the signature stuff. Here's another way to kind of look at that. All right. <clears throat> when antivirus was first released, the internet didn't exist. So we got our signature updates via, you know, having your modem call another modem. And that worked because malware wasn't getting updated that quickly. Further, what were your chances of getting infected? Right? It was usually like your buddy came over and put a floppy disk in your computer because, hey, floppy disks were still used back then. So the model worked, having a signature based model to look for the bad stuff worked out just fine. Now, that changed, right? All of a sudden, the internet's there. Stuff is getting propagated quicker. All of a sudden, people are making money off of this. So malware is being created faster. You know, there's estimates to, you know, a couple dozen, couple hundred strains of malware get created every minute, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're not going to write signatures to keep up with that. So a lot of these endpoint vendors had to pivot and go for a behavior analytic perspective instead. They went to whitelisting. So they went to, hey, if it's been digitally signed by these vendors, you can run the code. If it's unknown, if it's something, you know, acting differently, no, we're not going to let it run. And that's a much safe, safe, safer posture to have. We're going through the same thing in this industry. So we've moved away from, hey, you can write a couple of signatures in, your, you know, in a seam, look at some malware and say, oh, I'll write these SIGs to look for these types of log entries and hope you're going to catch anything because it's changing all the time. So the reason we look at behavior analytics is because it's different behavior. You know, again, I talked about Sunburst, right? This was new, cutting edge. Anybody relying on signatures, anybody relying on that, that I'll be honest, a little bit of a narciss narcissistic hypothesis that you can think of everything the bad guys can to so be able to come up with signatures at that, that they're not more creative than you. All of those folks failed. The ones that did okay, behavioral analytics. Hey, my solar wind server is calling to an IP address that it never did before, and the vendor knows nothing about it. That's, an un, you know, that's a very suspect behavior. Those folks were able to respond in and create firewall rules that stopped them from getting compromised by the Russians. 
So this is one of the reasons why I tend to push behavioral analytics very hard in this class, because it's the only way that I have found that you'll consistently find the new stuff that's coming down the wire, not the stuff that's already just broken everything. All right, so we talked about the long connections. So we had a lab for that. So let's go through this one. So I'm going to go into the long connection screen. We've only got two entries here. That makes it pretty easy, right? So what's our first one? Our first one is an internal IP talking to some IP out on the internet uh, that's out in DigitalOcean. We don't see any DNS information associated with this, but we've got a 24-hour long connection. So, okay, the handshake probably took place before this data collection started going through. It's going to TCP 9200. That's kind of odd. And it's our second one, just real quick, going to another system that's part of Microsoft's environment and another 24-hour connection. So we didn't see the handoff. We're not seeing fully qualified domain name information. So that one's making me feel a little less suspect versus the first one. Let's do a little bit of investigation into that IP address. I'm going to go through and run it through VirusTotal. So VirusTotal is saying, oh, it's in DigitalOcean. And oh, hey, it's associated with this domain, AIHhosted.com. Now, I talked about don't do anything active. Don't do anything the attackers can detect, right? Here's kind of a little exception for that. One of the things I could do is go to some environment that is not on the network I'm being protected and that I'm protecting. So maybe this is on my phone through Verizon as opposed to through the net local Wi-Fi and go see what is that domain. So I'm just going to copy that and let's pretend that you know this new tab is um you know my Verizon phone or it's a virtual desktop I've set up in Amazon or whatever. And let me go hit that site and see what happens. Well, notice I got redirected to here, active countermeasures. Who were they? Purchasing. Have we spent any money? Are we, are we paying money for services to active countermeasures? And they may come back and say, yeah, the security team bought a product through that. And this is what's going on with that. You know, great. Now I know there's a business need associated with that. So, well, wait a minute, Chris. What if that had been an attacker? And now you're hitting port 80 on their web server. They're going to know you're coming. No, they won't. Try this at home. Spin up a VM inside of Amazon and record how many connection attempts you get on TCP port 80 and TCP port 22 in a given day. Shut that IP off, move someplace else, try it again. There's going to be hundreds, if not thousands, on both of those two ports. Those are getting hit constantly. So for you to just hit port 80 to see what's there, yeah, that's not even going to blip on their radar. So had this been the attacker's environment instead, and we tried to hit the website, you know, we'd see, okay, the web server's not responding, or none of this is, is not, you know, this is nonsensical information. Well, this doesn't look like anybody who's a business partner would at least be, you know, have that information to kind of work with too. So that's one of the ways we could go through and run this down. I do that for my second IP, and we'll hit virus total again. Virus total comes back and says, "Ah, that's part of Aka DNS, Windows Notify, Windows Notification Services, Windows Notification Services, Windows.com, Traffic Manager.net. That's part of Microsoft uh, property as well." This looks like it's consistently associated with Windows Notification Services under Microsoft. So that tells me that this is one. I could probably just go in and create a safe list entry plot. So our first one would need to see, is that a legitimate business partner? Yes or no? If no, we need to do some more homework. If yes, we can safe list it. Line item number two, this looks like Windows notification services. If we're running Windows boxes, they're probably calling out to that address. Now, there's a gray line here, right? Are we okay with that? Are we okay with like, you know, message bus services and Windows notification services going back to Microsoft? Maybe, maybe not. You know, that's something that we might identify as part of our threat hunt report and somebody else needs to decide, is it a security risk or not? For most environments, it's not a security risk. 
if we're a three-letter government agency or military organization, and we only want like patches to come through our own servers that we vetted them first, yeah, that might actually be considered a security risk and we'll want to hand it, handle it differently. So I don't want to get too deep down that rabbit hole right now. But the short answer is both of these are looking okay. So that brings us back to, if I go to Web Beacons, this first entry. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to dig a little bit deeper on this one. Go in and kind of look at the protocol. If you're working with the VM, right? You've got the original Zeek logs. So one of the things you could do is less space dash capital S dash X 20 HTTP.log and start going through the log box and see if anything looks kind of weird or off there. You know, make notes of the IP addresses that we're working with here and then go through that. At a minimum, I'm going to give everybody a hint. It says it's a Windows 7 system. Does it claim to be a Windows system, 7 system all the time? <clears throat> Go take a look under client signatures and see what you can find. All right, I'll give you a little bit of time to go through this one. So we're doing this lab. I'm going to go on mute while we do. So there was some questions about the command I used to go through the Zeek logs, and I apologize for kind of jumping off of that really quickly. I gave it to you in Discord. This was it here. But I'm going to give you another little trick with this too. So I'm just going to hit up arrow to pull up my last command. So I'm typing in less space dash capital S. So that tells it it's okay if lines run off to the right so it doesn't line wrap and everything looks really messy. X20, leave 20 spaces for each column. That helps to kind of spread things out, make them easier to read. And then HTTP.log is the file that I want to go in and view. And I'm going to hit enter on that. Now, the first thing I notice is connections going from my internal system to this external IP address. And that's the external IP address that I'm interested in here. It'd be nice to have that highlighted so that it's easy to see as I kind of scroll through this file. In case there's other HTTP sessions in there, I don't get those mixed up. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to highlight that IP address. I'm going to select copy. And one of the things you can do with the less command is you can do searches. If I hit the backslash key, that allows me to do a search. So I'm going to hit backslash and then paste in that IP address and hit enter. And now notice that IP address gets lit up. So as I scroll through, you know, let's say I'm looking for different things that I see going on. Well, I know these don't match because that's a different IP, so I can ignore those. Keep scrolling down, and I should get others. Yep, see, that one doesn't match. So it allows me to very quickly kind of highlight what I'm interested in and kind of jump through from there. Give you a couple more minutes, and then we'll talk about this one. Okay, let's talk about this one a little bit. So. I mentioned client signature and going in and taking a look at that. So if I go in and I look at this source IP, right? And I, if I had multiple IPs in my environment, I could just go in and highlight this, control C, go under search, control V, and tell it only look for that. Uh, and it's grabbing something else out of my copy, but you get the idea. I could just filter in on this IP, but I want you to notice something here. Wicca agent, it's going to adl.windows.com, Microsoft Crypto 10, Microsoft Wins 10, Microsoft Delivery Optimization 10. All of these are associated with a Windows 10 system, except for this one, which is 3,011 connections to this IP address that we were, that were in the process of analyzing that identifies itself as Windows 7. So one of the first, when I see a weird user agent string like that, one of the first things I always try to verify is, does it use that weird user agent string all the time? And here can, we can say no. It's using a bunch of others that are consistent in identifying itself as being Windows 10, but it's identifying itself as Windows 7 when it talks to this one host. Well, that's really suspicious, right? Let's go back to the Zeke logs. 
So the other thing was, you know, we mentioned there's no fully qualified domain name that was queried. That made it really suspicious. The other thing that made this suspicious was looking at the URI. <clears throat> so this is the URI that was being requested when we connected to that server. Well, that's a really long string, right? That looks really suspicious. And it looks like it's asking the same URI over and over again. Well, that's kind of weird. That's not how people browse a website, right? Usually you'll hit one page, hit another, hit another, would expect to see different data requests. Now, maybe there's others. We'll go through and we'll check that in just a minute. So that URI looks really odd. Our user agent string looks weird. We talked about that. Um, 200 OK. So this weird long URI we sent to the server, the server was OK with that. It didn't generate an error. So that might be weird. And then I don't think there's anything else in here that's really all that interesting. Nope. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go through and I'm going to say, all right, let's take a look at, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, cat, HTTP, whoop, it helps if you type on the right screen, Chris. <laughs> all right. There we go. Cat HTTP dot log. I'm going to pipe that through Zcut. So Zcut is what allows me to pull out different fields. So I'm going to say ID dot RESP underscore H. I want you to print out the destination IP. And then I also want to see the URI. And then I'm going to pump that through head just to look at the first 10 lines, just to see, is this the data I actually want to go take a look at? So when I do that, yeah, I'm getting, <clears throat> here's that IP address, here's the URI, so that looks like it's working okay. So the next thing I want to do is I want to go through and I want to say, okay, now let's take that data, and we want to make sure we're only looking at URIs that are associated with the system. So I'm going to say I want to grep for that IP address. And then I'm going to say, I want to sort and then pump that through unique dash C. So we're catting the HTTP.log file, pulling out these two fields. We're saying only keep fields where the destination IP is this one I'm investigating. So any traffic going out of the web servers, ignore that. And then I'm saying sort the data. So anytime the URI is the same, they're one right after another. And then unique dash C it. Rather than printing out all of them, I just want you to print out one line per uh, IP URI combination that you see. And dash C says, count them up and tell me how many of them there are. When I hit enter, it comes back and tells me this is what it comes back with. So this is telling me that 3,011 connections. Oh, wait, we said there were 3,011 total. So this is all of them all showed this destination IP with this one same URI the entire time. So we're just banging away at the same URI over and over and over and over and over again. Oh, that definitely does not look like a user browsing the web, right? This is pro programmatic. So where do we go from here? Well, this looks odd. It's not breaking any communication rules, but it definitely looks odd. I don't want to dig into this one a little bit deeper. So one of the things I'll usually start doing is looking for unique strings that I can go after. <clears throat> so for example, <clears throat> excuse me. So for example, I might take this user agent string and Google that and see if it comes back with anything interesting. Now it's a user agent string. So it may come back with stuff that is not related to what we're doing at all. I do have one kind of unique string here that's not too long. I and I have this string that's really long and unique, but that's so long and unique it's probably not going to match on anything. Further, look at the string. That, to me, looks like obfuscated information. In other words, it, it looks kind of randomized. And anytime you see randomized stuff, it means it's been obfuscated or possibly encrypted. So that might actually be an encoded message. So if I Google that, 
I'm probably not going to come back with anything. But this string here, it's short, sweet enough that I can search on it. It's long enough. I might find unique hits. I'd start Googling that to see what I come up with. And if you do Google that, you find out that, yeah, this is part of a malware kit. Question was, why are we only analyzing beacons and leaving DNS alone? Well, let's go look at DNS. No results found. It's no results found because we didn't see any domain where we queried 100 or more resource records. If I drop that down to zero, that'll show us everything. And the busiest domain we saw was Microsoft. We looked up 24 resource records. Well, it's Microsoft. We said they're one of the major internet properties. We're not going to worry about them until we see more than a couple hundred, right? So from a DNS perspective, there wasn't anything in this file that's really worth kind of going after. There may be in others, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but for now, there isn't. Okay. So let's see if I missed anything. So I did give you, yep, so, so this is when we were running down the long connection one. We talked about that. We talked about, hey, it's directing to this AC Hunter thing. I would go to purchasing and say, are we doing business with active countermeasures? If so, this is okay. If not, yeah, I may need to do a little bit more research. The second one, we said, yeah, that looks like it's Windows Notification Service. We're going to assume that's okay. And then, um, yeah, we got into the last lab where we said, okay, let's dig a little bit deeper into this one IP that we have left. So everything else we looked at, we said, this is probably okay. We're down to just one. So let's dig a little bit deeper on this. And when we dig a little bit deeper, we saw, oh, it's identifying itself as Windows 7. The system normally identifies as Windows 10. That's suspicious. Um, here I went through and did, yeah, you could do a session size analysis. We talked about how with C2 channels, you're going to see a, a smaller session size or with a majority of the traffic. That's your heartbeat. And you could potentially see multiple session size larger than that. So if you went to view two on the Beacon web screen, let me do that real quick. Because I didn't do that here. So if I go to view two, this looks like a heartbeat. 2,856 connections out of the 3,011 were 689 bytes in size, but I've got some other sizes in here. So this could potentially be activation of this command and control channel. So it has C2 characteristics to it, and even worse, it looks like it's C2 activity that's actually being activated. Our largest session size, 1,305 bytes. So when we start getting into, if this is really C2, what have they done? They haven't grabbed any big files yet. This to me looks like they're doing a little bit of internal reconnaissance. We've got a bunch of smaller session sizes taking place. All right. So that's that. Yeah, we ver validated there are no DNS records for this, which we saw through the AC Hunter interface already anyway. There was no DNS query done that returned this IP. Uh, we looked at this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that user agent string that we said looks weird. We talked about, uh, yeah, Windows 10, but seven in suspect connections. We looked at this for the AC Hunter interface. It was a little bit easier to follow there. So we saw that normally this identifies as Windows 10, but in this case here, it's identifying itself as Windows 7. That makes it suspect. Well, if we went through and kind of added up what does what, which again, we saw this already through the AC Hunter interface. I'm just so showing you, if you're not using AC Hunter, this is how you could derive the same information. But we can see one IP, we're using Windows 7. Everybody else, we're using these other strings that identify as Windows 10. We looked at the URI, we said, all of them pointing the same place. This looks like encoded information, but this RMVK30G, that looks kind of unique. Maybe Google can kind of help us out with that. And yeah, Googling it returns its Fiesta EK. So yeah, this is definitely associated with some known malware. So we're seeing C2 activity leaving our environment that has a string in it that's associated with known malware. Yeah, we are definitely ready to hit the big red incident response button. My next step would be, okay, 
let's pivot and go into deep dive and look at this IP. Is anybody else talking to it? If so, they are now part of this incident response as well. If it's only this one system, we're going to be in better shape. And bother doing that here because we've only got data on this one source. Now, it's worth noting this 14,000 connection pairs in this data. We ended up with one that looked interesting. How long did it take us to find that out of the 14,000? And it took a little bit because I talked a lot, even though I shouldn't be with the way my voice is right now. But it, we found it pretty quickly. And actually, it was the first thing that AC Hunter showed us and told us you should pay attention to this. So out of those 14,000 connections that took place, the tool did a really good job of prioritizing what do you need to actually pay attention to. That's kind of cool. That's what makes this a whole lot easier. All right. We're going to do it again. This time, we're going to do it in the lab two directory. So I'm going to clear my screen. Where am I? PWD. I'm in the labs lab one directory. So I'm going to type in cd space dot dot forward slash lab two. So that tells cd go up one directory back down to lab two. Once I do that, I'm in the lab two directory. I've got a fewer number of files here, right? So notice, what do I have Zeek logs for? I have con.log and dns.log. That's about it. That may be a clue about what's worth, worth investigating when we get into AC Hunter. But first, we need to import this data. So our command to do that is Rita space import space star.log space and we'll just call this lab two i'm going to highlight that throw it into discord so everybody else has it too and now i'm going to hit enter on that it wants my password hunting now notice no host data to analyze, no Yukon data, no proxy data, no TLS data, exploded DNS. So when I get into my AC Hunter interface, which, hey, let's do that now. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, let's go to AC Hunter, go back to the dashboard, go to settings. We got a new Lab 2 directory. Load that up. Give this one a run. Well, wait a minute, Chris. What do you mean give it a run? There's no data. I don't see any IP address. It says no results found. Look up here. That's giving you a little bit of a hint where to go from here. Go check this one out. I'll give you a couple minutes and then we'll go through and we'll talk about it. So Black Panther has a good question. Black Panther's question is, can I do this with my existing stuff or do I need to set something like this up? And the example they give is, can I do something similar to AC Hunter by using my firewall locks? Unfortunately, the answer to that is no. Why? A couple of reasons. One is uh, your firewall logs may not necessarily show you everything. You may not be logging all your drops, right? Especially when you talk about outbound activity. A lot of times we don't log anything outbound. Now, you could go in and change that, right? You could say, hey, yeah, okay, Chris, but I'll go in and I'll log all my outbound traffic. I promise. You could do that. One of the first problems you run into is rate limiting. Your firewall is not necessarily going to log everything. In other words, if you have a system that's connecting up, let's say, five times a second, sometimes it can be even as low as like 10 times a minute. Your firewall log decides, oh, I already showed you that traffic. I'm not going to show it to you again. So you're going to end up missing connections that took place. Further, your firewall log isn't going to give you duration. So if you have any long connections in there, it isn't going to tell you about that. Yeah, you could go back to the state table and then have some timing information in it. But with the exception of the firewall built into BSD, I haven't found a firewall state table that actually records the duration of the connection. The timing information is how much time has gone by since the last packet I saw. That's it. So I have tried really hard to use firewall logs and do this, 
and I've never been able to get it to work consistently. I've never been able to consistently get the data I need to get this done. Thus, my comment about Zeek is one of your best threat hunting tools. All right, I'll give you a little bit, then we'll go through and cover this. So this one hopefully was kind of easy for you because we didn't have any data here, right? All we had was this in the top left, potential C2 over DNS cases detected, which kind of tells us, go look at the DNS module. Let me open that up. So I'm going to go to the DNS module for that. Now, when I do, the default is to only show me when 100 resource records or more were pulled out of that domain. I can play around with this number if I want to get more visibility, but there really isn't going to be a whole lot in here. I may want to drop it to zero if I want to see the individual queries. We'll talk more about that in a second. But let's start with this top line. So this is saying that in the domain honestimnotevil.com, oh, well, clearly that's a safe domain, right? Because it's been self-identified as not being evil. So we know we're okay. That's cool. But we looked up 2,074 resource records in that domain. This is the raw number of queries. We're less worried about that. It's the unique resource records we queried that we always want to focus in on. So we looked up 2,074 hosts in this domain we've never heard of before. That doesn't sound right. If I go in and look at utilization, I have the system doing DNS queries, this 172 system, but no systems even that are connecting any resources associated with that domain. Ah, that doesn't sound right. Right? We would expect people to connect to these resources that we're looking up. So yeah, this looks highly suspicious. Now, when I start looking at the URI, notice anything interesting about the host parameter here, right? So this first set of values would be my host name, period, honest, I'm not, honest, I'm not evil .com. One of the things that strikes me, that kind of looks like hex. Hmm. Yeah, so it's hex, Chris. If it's hex, that may be somebody encoding information. In other words, they didn't want to deal with the overhead of encrypting it. So what they did is they just took their ASCII characters and converted it to hex. That means that if we could line up all these queries in the order they were submitted, we might actually be able to reconstruct what they were sending through just by converting all of this stuff back into ASCII again. Something to kind of keep in mind, but that's for a class for another day. So let's see if I missed anything here. So this one was pretty straightforward, but I included this in just to kind of give you a view of what the DNS data stuff looks like. Uh, let's see. Did I miss anything? I don't think I did. As we said, yep, C2. Look for that. 2,074 unique resource records, too high for an unknown domain, and no one is accessing those resources. Yeah, that's something we definitely want to pay attention to. Now, what do we want to do next? Well, this host that's doing these lookups, whether that's the compromised host or just one of my resolvers, kind of depends on where we are when we're collecting this data. If we're collect collecting it at the internal interface of the firewall, and I have internal resolvers, it's just one of my resolvers. So now maybe what I need to do is go to this resolver, run ngrep, which is supported on Linux, Unix, and Windows, and tell ngrep, grab all packets that have honestimnotevil.com in them. And you can even focus it in on UDP 53. Now that'll show you who's sending those queries to your DNS resolver. That's going to be the IP address that's in a compromised state. So with DNS, the IP you see rarely is the one that's actually compromised. Sometimes you got to do a little bit of backtracing first. And we said, hey, this looks like hex. This is probably encoded information. All right, let's go to lab three. So I'm going to say cd space dot dot forward slash lab you guessed it three and that'll put me in the lab three directory i take a look i've got a better mix of files in here this time 
So I'm going to say Rita import star.log lab three. Once I hit enter, that'll go through and start processing the files. So it looks like we're getting a little bit of everything here. We're not seeing any. So there's no proxy beacon data. So there's no proxy stuff to worry about. Let me go back into AC Hunter. Here's lab three. Go ahead and open that up. And now I want you to go through and do a full hunt. So check for beacons, log connections, DNS. What do you see that looks like, yeah, this is probably okay and we can safe list it. And what do you see that you look at and say, hmm, this makes me super suspicious. Go through, give this a run through, and then we'll go through and we'll talk about it. Okay, I'm afraid my scratchy throat and having to talk a little slower uh, has gotten us to the end of this class a little bit behind. So I usually give you a little bit more time to go through this one. I apologize for jumping in. I want to be mindful of the time because we only got five minutes left. Uh, and I want to make sure you've got a good answer for your questions here. So let's just kind of jump into this one and see what we find. So AC Hunter is telling us that there's a strong web beacon score, the strong IP beacon scores, and we've got long connections that are running in a 24-hour period. Those are all the stuff that's worth kind of drilling down into. So let's start with Beacon Web. So if I go to my first entry, this is going to noobo 2 skypetmcomtw Hmm. <clears throat> so it kind of looks like Skype, but it kind of doesn't. That just doesn't look right to me, right? Because Skype would be skype.com. Not Skype trademark.com, not even Microsoft's that bad, right? They don't feel the need to put trademark right in their domain name. So that looks a little suspicious to me. The HTTP server is an IP address. So we mentioned the host parameter in the HTTP header should be the fully qualified domain name the user was trying to get to. And here it's not. So it looks like they looked up that name, but they didn't actually, you know, that, that it isn't encoded properly. So, excuse me, it's the other way around. So it says they're trying to get to this in the header, but they didn't actually look up that name to get there. So that's kind of odd. Uh, a couple of folks mentioned this. Microsoft Internet Explorer is the user agent strength. Oh, yeah, that looks totally legit, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Is that consistent? Well, let's go to client signatures and say Windows 10, Windows 10, Windows 10, talking to this one IP address. <clears throat> it's this Skype, weird Skype thing. It's a .tw. Do we need to worry about that? Maybe. Excuse me just a sec. Sorry about that. My voice is just barely going to make it through this class. Not necessarily. A lot of uh, major. Uh, internet properties will use their domain name with a country code within that country. So had this data been collected in Taiwan, that wouldn't necessarily trouble me, right? Except for the fact that it's Skype TM. It's got to say, if, it was, if this was skype.com.tw and this data was collected in Taiwan, yeah, I'm not going to worry about that. But the fact that it's Skype TM, you no, know, that does, doesn't sound right. So this one's looking like it's kind of suspicious. If I look at my beacon graph on the bottom, consistent every hour, we're getting about 135 connections taking place, somewhere in that range there. If I look at my dwell time connections, look at this. I got a bell curve going. Hmm, what did we say about bell curves? Yeah. Excuse me. This is looking like a beacon. This looks like something we need to be concerned about. Okay, let's come back to that one. Let's look at the second entry. Self.events.data.microsoft.com. Invalid certificate, no. So this looks like it's okay. So I just simply go in and I'd probably do events.data.microsoft.com. Safe list that bad boy. Make it go away. <clears throat> oh, 
What else we got? Hmm. It did not safe list that out. That is weird. What did I do wrong? That should make it go away. Yeah, that made it go away. Arc.microsoft.com, although now we're starting to get more into the data noise. But yeah, you know, MSN traffic, maybe this is okay, maybe not. Microsoft uses MSN for a lot of ads these days. So is this okay to safe list or not? It kind of depends on whether you're okay with ads, right? This might be one I'd flag and I'd say, hey, so not malicious, but we're serving ads up to it. Is this really something we want to be doing? Maybe we want to create a firewall role. If not, yeah, okay, fine. Then just go ahead and safe list it. And then our last entry is down in the noise. We don't need to worry about that, but that looks like it's okay too. If I go to my long connections, we've got two, and these are the same two we had earlier. So had we safe listed them, they wouldn't be showing up here at all. We wouldn't have to see them at all. So again, one of the benefits of safe listing is that you don't keep re-going over the same things again. And because we chose not to safe list those earlier, they end up showing up here a second time. Uh, Let's see what else. DNS looks okay, so we're okay there. Yep. These are reverse ARPA lookups. Microsoft.com, our biggest hitter again. So we're down to just this one. So now for me, we know the user agent string looks weird. So now what I'd want to go in and take a look at is what does that URI look like? So I'm in my lab three directory, and let's see if I can't just up arrow. And yeah, we'll just find this. Oh, look at this. That's a really weird looking string, right? I'm not happy about that one. Um, Let's use our less command. So I'm going to say less space dash capital S dash X 20 http.log and i just kind of want to i can verify that my first set of connections showing up here are all to the same ip so all of this data will be associated with that it's a get request my host parameter is this newbie string and we said there was no dns query for this so how did this end up in the host string It's the DNS query, what you look for, the DNS query that your browser chooses to put in the host parameter when it sends the request out. That's not what happened here. So that tells me, yeah, this isn't coming from a browser. We've got this really long string here that looks like encoded information. And it looks like the same thing we're seeing before, where it's the same URI over and over and over again. And if we went through and sorted through it, we'd see, yeah, that in fact, that's what's going on. Microsoft Internet Explorer for the user agent string. That doesn't sound right to me. 200, okay. So all of these are, are um, the server's okay with all of these requests. Yeah, this is, a t- this is a bad one. Now, one of the challenges we have here is before we did some Googling on a portion of the URI and we could figure out what it was. FC001, well, that's all hex. So I don't think Google's going to be really helpful with that. So I don't think we can really use that, but we could probably do some lookups around this and that might help us out. And we can do that right through AC Hunter. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, click on that IP address and say, Hey, virus total, tell me about that fully qualified domain name. And virus total comes back and says nine different security vendors have flagged this. Anytime you see one, don't worry about it. Any sign we see two, don't worry about it. But when you start seeing five, six, nine different vendors have all flagged it, that leads credence to it. That makes it something that may be worth kind of digging into a little bit deeper. So if I Google this, I'll probably find out some additional information. And notice that this is popping up saying, uh, notice we've got a reference here to Pity Tiger. So this is actually part of the Pity Tiger attack. Let's see if I missed anything. So our hints. Yeah, we talked about feels a little scammy. The internet user agent string, that does not look right. Um, It was definitely a consistent beacon. We were seeing the classic bell curve that says this might be associated with Cobalt Strike. 
when we went in and did some research on it, it popped back. So notice that this time six vendors were flagging it. Now we're seeing nine. That's not that's not surprising. Um, we looked at some other stuff. All of this looked like stuff that we could safe list. Uh, oh, there was some open DNS stuff in there too that we missed. But if we're using open DNS for our DNS services, that would explain why that's taking place. So we could safe list that. Uh, long connections, we said same ones as before. And what if you want to keep practicing? So if you go to the active, so you've done this, right? And you're like, wow, Chris, this is kind of cool. I want to keep practicing. I want to get better at this. Here's what you do. Go to the Active Countermeasures website, do a search on malware of the day, and you'll hit all the blog entries that are on malware of the day posts. And I mentioned, don't look at them yet. Go to the page, but shut your eyes, skip to the bottom, because at the bottom is going to be a PCAP file. Find that PCAP file, <clears throat> process it through Zeek to create the Zeek logs, and then import those Zeek logs into AC Hunter, same way we did here, and do your analysis. See what you can figure out. Now, once you think you've run down what's evil and what's not, now go back to the blog entry. What does the blog entry point out? Did you catch everything? If you didn't catch, like maybe you missed the fact the user agent string was Microsoft Internet Explorer. Okay, great. Now you know you need to tweak your process to check that and to validate it against the other user agent strings being used out of that same system. Great. Now let me go back up here again, grab the next malware of the day, try it again. So this is going to help you vet your process before you actually end up with malicious code on your environment. If you're interested in this demo, if you want to see the commercial version of this, just try to demo in the Zoom chat. Um, not Discord, because it tends to get lost with all the comments that are taking place. So in Zoom would be cool. Or you can just hit the website and request a demo that works too. Um, and some closing thoughts. Remember the process, right? <clears throat> Connection persistency. Can identify a business need. Let me check out that external IP to see if that helps me validate if there's a business need or not. Protocol analysis. Endpoint analysis on the internal system. By the time I get to that point, I should be able to successfully identify, I think it's safe, we can add it to a safe list, or I think we're going to have a bad day, we need to go into incident response mode. And thank you for attending. <clears throat> I, you know, I, Folks refer to this class as free, and to me it's not, because you have dedicated your time to this class. This is not free. This is six hours of your life that's gone that you can't get back, no matter how much money you have in your pocket. So the fact that you chose to attend this class and stick around to the end, uh, we really do appreciate that very much. Yeah, go get better and go, don't talk for 48 hours. Yeah, my wife might actually appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. That's it, folks. Thank you very much. I'll hang out in Discord and ask, answer questions for a little bit. But yeah, I definitely need to go like find stuff and rest my voice and all of that. Um, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>